the load, he's screaming, two minutes, two minutes, and everyone's going, two minutes, and he's like, two, two, two minutes, two minutes, and we're, we're oh, I better yeah. switch on. And literally, look, you're in the zone. It got called Operation Certain Death in the end because the, the only real option we have is just to fly a helicopter straight into the middle of the camp, jump straight on top of everybody and have it out with them. <laughs> that's, that's, that's more, that's what we did. <laughs> this was the first major punch-up I'd ever been in, really. I've been blown up a couple of times in Ireland, you know, I've dodged a couple of bullets down again, but never never a full-on, right, I'm in your camp, here we go, come and get us, like, do you know what I mean? Somali pirates, they're taking ships. If these little boats come along, right, they've got all the guns, they've got AK-47s, I run into the bridge to see if I've got anything left I can throw at this lunatic before he gets on. And the captain used to have a little fridge, you know, those little yeah, travel fridge yeah, types. Yeah. I've got one chance with this fridge, right? So I lean over there. Hey! <laughs> I'm oh, like, right? <laughs> <laughs> <Bye. Yeah. laughs> Phil, welcome to the show, mate. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I'm very much looking forward to this one, mate. No, we'll... <laughs> <laughs> get it on. <laughs> Let's get it on. <laughs> Not going to start a like, <laughs> <laughs> Let's roll all the way back, Phil. Where did you grow up and how did you become one of the most well-respected people ever to be in the SAS? Well, so, look, it's, a, it's a long old story, right? So fasten your seatbelt because we're going to smack this one out, yeah, right? Mate. Basically, I was adopted as a kid. Um, my, my, my biological parents... Fell on hard times, whatever. Um, they, 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 they put me up for adoption. I was adopted to a family down south. Now, this family in Southampton, they thought they were sort of like middle class, but they weren't. Do you know what I mean? They lived on the council estate. They thought they were something they weren't. I don't think they really got themselves into something they wanted because I got beaten mercilessly as a kid by the old man. He sort of like turned on me, lost his job, and I think the week when I was moving down there. Lost his job. And how old were you when he turned on you, roughly? Oh, mate, I, I, I've, my earliest memories, my earliest memories are of him hitting me. You know, they, they, you know, and I had this sort of like thing in my own head whereby if he would hit me, I could, I could, I could take it for so long, but if I screamed and wriggled, then he would carry on. And I've worked out that if I stopped screaming and wriggling and went limp and sort of like uninteresting, he'd leave it alone like a dog, right. like a dog with a bone. And... Do you know what, right? This is the first... My, my early members are thinking, that's a result. Mm. It's a honking result. It's not a great result, is mm. it? But it's a result, and it's one step further than the beating. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it was a positive step, in my view. But yeah, yeah, no, growing up wasn't great. Not saying it was all bad, but, you know, with them in the early years... So did great. they... Did they? Did, did your parents know who they, you were, they were passing you on to? No, 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 no. Once, once you go into that system, once you go, right, there you go, have him, you literally... And just hand your kid over, you do the off, wow. you never see him again. And they get told, don't even bother looking, because you won't be able, you, you won't be have the access to go and get him. And like, where you know were you mean? born then? I was born in Lambeth. You're born in, in Lambeth, Lambeth yeah, and then you come down to Southampton. Then I come down to Southampton, literally. Wow. In a motorbike and sidecar. Yeah. That's all I had. They had no car or nothing like that. And what rough what year roughly were we talking here? Sixty nine. Okay. Yeah, sixty nine. I had to stay in hospital for quite some time because I had a thing called pyloric stenosis where I was born with some on my stomach on the outside. Right. So once I stuffed that away and put it all back and zipped it up. Then, I, then they'd let me go. Like, mm. So I was a bit late to be adopted, but it was like eight or nine months old, straight down the road, down to Southampton, and wow. then brought up by these two. But like I say, the old man had major drink problems. He'd lost his job. He just wanted to smack me about. Started smacking her about as well. Eventually, she threw him out. Yeah. But then she turned on me. She started smacking me about as well. So it was like... There's no it, win. Yeah, it was just... it was, it was, it was yeah. it, So failing at school, Failing at just about everything I did, um, I ended up, I, I got a bit of a lifeline. I got sent to this public school, big posh place in Oxford, passed, this, passed a test, nice. and they sent me off. When I got there, because they'd all been through the prep school system, yeah. they were all oh, 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 yeah. posh kids, like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Who's this lunatic? Yeah. Do you know what I, mean? I was in, they all had their kit tailored, I had the flares on. Yeah. I'm like, oh no, he's a, they used to call me Kevin, they used to bully me, so I got, I got bullied there. Eventually, took no more of that. Beat someone up, got sent out, was expelled. Second school had been expelled from. Ended up in the care system proper, and from there it just sort of like went went worse and worse really so for a couple of years. Explain to me what the care system's like. Right, so, so you're talking the care system in the seventies here, late seventies, early eighties. We talking early eighties, yeah. Okay. And it was you went to an assessment centre. Now assessment centres were quite brutal, and if you messed around, like I, used, I used to, any opportunity to get out the door, and I'd run away. Right. Every time, down the road, arrested in South Sea, arrested in, you get taken back. Of course, the old bill in them days was slightly different. You got a clout, didn't yeah. you? You know what I mean? You got a bit of a clout, sent back, then you'd be locked up. So in Glen House, for instance, I was locked up, I was banged up all day, do you know what I mean? And just let out for dinners. But it just, it was a different world. 
The other thing that was there at the time, and something that took me a long, long time to talk about, I came across sexual abuse. You know, the, the people used to try and touch you and all that sort of stuff. And it started off with people trying to touch you. I've had someone expose himself in front of me, all that sort of stuff. And you were told quite categorically by these people that were grooming you, you dare say anything about this. You're the scumbag in this arrangement, do you know what I mean? You say anything about what's going on here and you're the one that's going to be in trouble because you're the one that everybody's looking at. You're the one that can't keep themselves in check. You're, you, I mean, you had no chance. You just, no. Had to, you just had to shut your mouth, take it, and just try and get through it as best you can, like, do you know what I mean? So there was no, there was no like Ed Master to go to and tell them or something. They were, no, just, they were making they you were, feel that, guilty. If you'd have gone, that, in fact, one of them was the Ed Master. Oh, the worst one I ever come across was was a guy, and he was the Ed Master. What's his name? His, his name was Houlihan. He's dead now. He's dead. Yeah, he's dead. Um, yeah, he later on in life got done with his stepdaughters. He he, he nonced them and ended up in Nick. Okay. Did a bit of time for it as well. So it wasn't, you know, guy was. Honky. So the care homes in the eighties in the eighties were just brutal. They were. Everyone yeah. I've interviewed who've been to care home has had a, a massive impact on them. It did, but it also, you know, the positive thing from that yeah. was I was learning. I was learning all these social skills, yeah. you know, pecking order, all that sort of stuff. Mm. You know, you were learning how to navigate yourself around some of this more honking stuff, mm. which isn't brokered by anybody mm. anymore. It's still there, but people don't know how to approach it. How old, how old were you when someone was doing this? 13 years old. 13. And I were mean, you at a size now? Because you were a big man. Were no, you a size? no, no, no. Tiny, tiny. Oh, okay. Absolutely tiny, yeah. Okay. You see photographs of me, I'm, I'm, I'm really small. Right, yeah, okay. I, I was quite slight, to be honest, yeah. And did you get to an age where this anger was building up, where you're, no, you're looking at it again, I know what you're doing. I'm 14 and 15, I know what you're doing. Mate, I'm, clo- I, I'm going to clock you. I, I clocked, clocked you. One. I clocked yeah. two of them. I yeah. ate one with a bed leg in a um, place called Glen House. Night Watchman came in. I'll take you in, son, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah you will, mate, won't you? I had a bed leg. One of those metal bed legs off yeah. the old, like, issued yeah. beds. Clunk, Bang. hit him. I went out the window. The mate that went out the window with me, he broke his ankles. He rolled about in the dirt all night. I dragged him off down the road. We had to end. But when we come back in the morning, funnily enough, oh, oh, what happened? Oh, yeah. They was nice as pie, these two geezers. So yeah. we never said nothing. Just kept our mouth shut. Just yeah. carry on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because they had this thing on you the whole time. You open your mouth, you're in the shit. Wow. Do you know what I mean? You're the one. Wow. And how, how old were you until you actually left the care home system? Um, I left just shortly before my 16th birthday. Um, I ended up on that youth training scheme thing. Hmm. Um, I lived in a trans- oh, again, I lived in this transport cafe. It was murder. So I had a room in a transport cafe, and every night there'd be a different lorry driver. So I'd, uh, I had the bottom bunk in a, in, a, in a just horrendous every night. I'd be like, oh, and I'd walk out, oh. what, and another, I, what, another trucker? Yeah, another in, trucker would come in or something. Yeah, 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 kipping oh, above you. Yeah. You'd hear the old. <laughs> oh my, well, it's just honking, you know what I mean? Just walking like, no, stop it, mate. Stop. Not another one. I don't want to hear you go to sleep. And then you just go, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, no, mate, honestly, disgusting. <laughs> I can laugh about it now, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The time you lay on your bed, going, oh my God, stop it, mate, stop it. <laughs> and what age, what age when you got out of that? The, the uh, well, so the YTS, yeah. great thing for me, I was teaching skiing. So go, break down the YTS. Youth training scheme yeah. was, was a scheme where, I, I don't know who brought it in, but you could you got £25 a week. Yeah. You got it as your dole money, but you had to do a job for it. So, you, you know, people would bricklay and all that. Through the children's home, I managed to secure me this thing teaching skiing down at a place called Cash Activity Centre. It was a right result. It was an easy job. It was great fun. Things were going really well. I thought, yeah. no, this is it. I'm, I'm in for life here. Yeah? Yeah. I'm a skiing instructor. What more do I need to be? Like, do you know what I mean? I've, I've made it. I, went, I, I, I skived it out for two years down there, right? Had a right laugh. And then at the end of it, the geezer who was employing people said, well, I can't really employ you, so you've got no qualifications. I mean, I left school for cycle proficiency. I took that twice. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I had nothing. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, oh, what do I do? And he just said to me, he said, have you ever thought about joining the army? And that was when I sort of like, I'd seen the CCF when I was in that public school, the posh school. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, that was all right. Yeah, mm. everyone was the same. And they pulled them green clothes on. Yeah. And that was it. So that, 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 that appealed to me. I was, look, I'd been done for... I'd clouted someone. So I was just starting to pick up a few offences. Yeah. You know, I'd punched someone. I'd been done for ABH. I had a, a GBH pending and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, do you know what I mean? So I really was on that sort of like, on the balance of, do I join up and probably save me skin for a little bit yeah. longer? Or do I just go down that road and take what's coming? Did you to- have anyone around you? Did you have any sort of like fatherly figure or a mentor or, or, or brother or an uncle or anyone? Or did, was it literally no. you on your own? No, just me on my own. And I couldn't trust these men because yeah. the, the, the people who had been in positions of power around me that were blokes had abused him. had all been nonsense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And they weren't they weren't particularly good role models at all. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They weren't my sort of people. Yeah. You know, as much as I'd like to have said that, you know, there'd been a but there wasn't. There just wasn't anyone there. Do you know what I mean? No. 
So it was, yeah, it was difficult. And then what was your route then after YTS? Literally, <laughs> Griff, who, I mean, Griff, Griff was a father figure in a way. Who's Griff? Who's Griff? Griff was in charge of this activity right, centre. okay, yeah. Right, and he was, but he wasn't, a, he wasn't, a, how can I say, he was a, ro- a, a, a posh man. <laughs> One of these lads, you know what I mean? He thought like, he had a map of England on his leg after three o'clock, he'd fall asleep, like, do you know what I mean? He wasn't like me and you. He wasn't a bloke, he wasn't yeah, a geezer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So although he, his intentions were on a brawl and he was a good man and he helped me out, yeah. I couldn't see him as a father figure because he was nothing like me whatsoever. Yeah. So he was the one who sort of like pushed me towards, right, get him to the careers office, get, yeah. him, get him gone, like, do you know what I mean? Careers office I went, sure enough, 10 weeks later, I'm, I'm, I'm stood on the line and I'm in, I'm, I've joined up, do you know what I mean? I've done all my medicals, I've passed all that, tick test, infantry, 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 infantry. Where do you want to go? How I'm off, as soon as, soon as good. So what's that, 18, 19? Um, I was about 18 years old. Yeah. Because I'd acted, I'd, I'd looked at it before and they told me to wait a year when I was 16 because I had these criminal... Yeah. These juvenile criminal things on me on me thing, which were. And know, did you find violence. did you find straight away when you went into the army like right this is for me? I liked it. Yeah, I did like it. Yeah. I st- I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I struggled a little bit in basic training. I'm not. You know, I didn't take things on. I was fit. Yeah. Now I always say this to young people now: if you're fit, yeah, that's one thing you've not got to worry about. Yeah. So I see people getting ready to go on runs and that, like, oh, God, we've got to go. And I'm not bothered about the run, but yeah, I'd sooner be running than learning because yeah. like, I can run all yeah. day. Like, do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm proper Tom and Dick when it comes to everything else, but I can run all day. That's right. Yeah, we'll do, where's the running start? Like, you know I mean? like, <laughs> so that's all right. So I'm happy with that. Yeah. Um, funny thing. So I I got got all the way through basic training. And this is true, so I got best improved recruit. But I only found out a couple of years ago that meant he was a complete idiot when he turned up and we got him over the line, like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> Quality. Uh, what was the route in there then? For you, did you feel like you were in a safe place? Yeah, so this was one of the things that really struck us. The minute I went through that camp gate, those lunatics, especially the one I mentioned earlier, that yeah. hooligan, he couldn't get at me anymore. Yeah. He couldn't come into camp. So I'm as safe as ours is in camp. Yeah. There's no way on God's earth he can get anywhere near me. He can't contact me, he can't, because he'd have mobile phones or yeah. nothing like that in them days. If I wanted to speak to somebody, I had to queue with everybody else. Yeah. We'll 10 be, in we'll the old thing. Yeah. 10 yeah. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and Oak, I got there before we got yeah. slung back to our pits. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have to have anything. And it's the first time in my life I genuinely felt I belonged somewhere. Brilliant. Because I'd earned my place there. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I belong somewhere. And, I, it, yeah, it was, and, and I felt safe. Because none of these people could come after me anymore. Mm. So I, t- I just couldn't have anything to do with them anymore, which was mm. great. And what was the route like there from 18 onwards to the to the journey you took to get into the SAS? Right, so I, I had a great time. In, 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 in the normal army, I, I did loads of cool courses. I did my parachuting course. I did my commando course. I did all these really well, cool courses. you did courses. both of them? I've done them both, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Commando yeah. and parachuting. Yeah, yeah, but a proper badge yeah. collector, me, like, yeah, <laughs> done it all. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, no, I had a great time. So, yeah. So just complain. break that just break that down then for the listener. What's the difference between going and doing your commando and doing your paratroop? Right, so if you join up as a paratrooper, yeah. you naturally do P Company, move on. If you join us with a commando, you do the commando course, you move on as a Royal Marine or as a paratrooper. Right. If you go infantry like I did, you will sometimes get the opportunity to do your commando course and then you're what you call an army commando. Yeah. Right, you earn your green lid, you do the commando tests, um, and the same with P Company. You do your you do your P company. You, you do your jumps. You can wear the wings. You can wear your red lid. So I just ended up in a position where I ended up doing them both. Yeah, which was good. So you know, it's it, not, I don't think as many people have done both, right? I don't know. No. There's more than what you'd think. Right, you know what okay. I mean? I know I know Aunt Middleton was banging on about it being the Holy Trilogy and all that sort of stuff. Shut up, man. Do you know what I mean? Loads of us have done it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> the Holy Trilogy. I never say who those were. <laughs> which one was harder? Um, oh yeah, people ask me this all the time. Yeah. So. P Company really is like getting a plastic mug and smashing your own head in with it yeah. for three weeks. Yeah. The commando course, you still got to smash your head in, but you got to, you got to think a little bit too. Do you know what I mean? Right. And you get gaps in between smashing your head in. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? So it's a longer course. It's just as brutal, but you get a bit of time off in between the brutality, and you have to think your way through that course as well. You do you do have to actually do some soldiering. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, so they're both tough for different reasons. And what did you do? So you've got both. Do you get to choose? You say, right, I want to be. No, in- I finished my commando course. Tried to transfer. I thought, right, I'll join the Marines now. And the officer, no, 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 you won't. No, no, you'll go back to your unit. So I literally didn't do anything with it. Um, and then the P Company, we had a, a, a we had a. a so the P Company is the, the parachute. P, yeah, the P yeah, Company, okay. the parachute regiment. Yeah. One, we had a platoon that had to be airborne trained for the period of time that we were we were in five airborne brigade as a as a normal infantry battalion. And you had to have a whole platoon of you that were airborne trained. So, you know, I got the para pay for those two years. And that was it. We moved on at the end of it. But I didn't. I, I ended up going on selection. So, 
So what made you? How long were you in? How long were you in that for before you went and done selection? Uh, about ten years. Okay. About ten years in the Princess of Wales's Royal Regiment and the Royal Hampshire, so infantry unit, a good infantry unit, I'm going to say. All right, enjoyed myself, but it was lacking. You weren't getting, and I upset quite a few people. I got busted from full screw down to Tom twice. Do you know what I mean? I was always in trouble. I was always, <laughs> I was all I ever wanted to be was a tip of the sword. I had no interest in promotion. Yeah. And I was getting to, at my 10 year point, I'm getting to the stage where they're going, right, you really need to be going on a, on a senior course now. You want to be looking at platoons. And I didn't want that. Yeah. I genuinely didn't want that. So I tried to transfer to the parachute regiment. Um, I went a slightly crooked route. You're supposed to go through sort of like ask you, but I went straight to the top and asked the brigade commander, which is a massive no no. Yeah. So I got myself in a bit of trouble for that. Well, you got in trouble for asking to go in? Yeah, because I didn't go through the correct train of command. You're okay. supposed to sort of like ask your line manager, the next line well, manager. I, saying, straight to I went straight to the top. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's the only way, isn't it? was <laughs> quite happy, yeah. <laughs> so I got a good screaming out for that. Then yeah. I fell out with my commanding officer over what had happened with that. and... I said to him, I'm going to bang my paperwork in for Special Forces then, sir. And he went, well, yeah, not yet, though. He said, you've got to do two years of Northern Ireland because he could stop you from going. And so <clears throat> that's what I did. I, I, I gave him his two years, and at the end of it, or halfway through it, he said, look, there's nothing really happening here. Why don't you get training, and off you go. So you said you gave him your two years. So you went to Northern Ireland for two years, did you? Yeah, well, I, I, ended, I ended up just doing a year of it. And what year are we talking here, roughly? Oh, dear, must 96, something like that. So 96, and how old have you been then? <sighs> 26, so like, at 69, I was born when yeah, I was so, so, yeah, 20, so, yeah, 27, something like that. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. what was that like for you, going from being back in England and then going, right, like, you're going out to Ireland. Were you excited to go to Ireland or did you hear I'd, the bad rumours? I'd done a, a two-year tour, I'd done a six-month tour, I'd done another six. So you were in and out of Ireland all the time. It okay. was... It, it was. It could be tough there. You could have your worst day ever, you know. And the IRA summed up perfectly, you know. We've got to be lucky once, you've got to be lucky all the time, haven't yeah. you? You know what I mean? That, that was the deal. It wasn't as kinetic as possibly Iraq and Afghanistan. But, I mean, if you got in a dust-up, you got in a dust-up. Do you know what I mean? And the bomb blows you up, whether it's in Afghanistan or Iraq. Yeah. It just wasn't those intense, you know, some of the lads that have done these Herrick tours and all that, they've been bob, 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 bob. Yeah. <laughs> every five minutes they've yeah. been on the other end of it. Do you know what I mean? Northern Ireland was a sort of like, right, OK, you know, you could go for days and days and days and days and months and years and possibly never with some people. But when it did go off, it went off like Chinese New Year. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it could be, you know, it could, it could go off properly, like, you know, so... <laughs> yeah, and you had that at the back of your mind. Yeah. You know what I mean? You knew that could what happen. What was the hostility like towards you lot out there from the Irish? It depends. It depends on who they were. And this is what I always say to people. You know, there's good and bads on both sides of the coin. So, you know, some of these people who lived in some of the harsher estates, they weren't, you know, they, they'd put on a front if somebody was there. Like, do you know what I mean? But they, they weren't too bad. They just wanted peace as much as any other. Yeah. You know, there was obviously people making a lot of money out of terrorism, a lot of, you know... So there was a lot of stuff going on in the background. There were some horrible honking people there, but yeah. there was people on both sides of the community who were just as honking. Do you know what I mean? There yeah. were some of these people, you know, these so-called you know terrorists on, on the on the Protestant side, just as much honking stuff as them. So mm. it was like you know you, you just got to weigh it up. I tried I tried to read a bit of history of the place before yeah. I went, so at least I had an understanding of what it was all about. And if you do go back in history. And you were Irish, you could probably go, well, hang on a minute, you swept us into the sea, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you nicked all our potatoes, yeah. you know? You didn't want potatoes back. <laughs> what, was the, what was a day-to-day for you like out in Ireland? Depends what you were what doing. What were you carrying? Depends what, yeah, it depends what you're doing. All, always SA80s in the normal role, in the, in the sort of like, the, the, the standard infantry roles with your SA80. You Is know, that SA80 with rubber bullets? No, 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 no. So that's the, the, just the, the, the normal assault rifle, yeah. which is the, the SA-80. You might have a baton gun if you're in town. No point carrying what? A, a baton gun. You know, well, that is a rubber bullet. Boom, right, boom. Okay. You can bounce off the off of people and yeah. all, that, all the good stuff. Um, <laughs> and then if you worked, I did a thing called COP, which was Close Observation Platoon. So again, we'd have the same, we'd hide in bushes and, and buildings and that sort of stuff and take photographs of people. And that was my real introduction to Special Forces because... They ran some of the training for you to do that. You had to work in plain clothes sometimes because you'd be driving cars and blokes would be getting out the boot and into yeah. bushes and all that sort of stuff. And it was good. It was cool. You're like, hang on, this is, this is proper. This is, mm. do you know what I mean? You were learning. There was more chance of you coming face to face with somebody who was actually going to get a tear up with. Yeah. So you were sort of like, yeah, it gave you that. It gave me a little bit of a spark to say, I'll tell you what, that's good. Imagine what these guys are doing. Yeah, like, okay. Do you know what I mean? So, so that was the bit that was the bit that got your ears pricked up to go. Yeah, on, that, that, that definitely. I mean, I'd seen them before. We'd had a couple of instructors on a jungle course that I'd done in Kenya. And so I knew that this unit exists. But I didn't really sort of like pay too much attention to it until I went to Northern Ireland. 
And then you knew if the troop turned up, you know, if, if a car full of lunatics with beards and, and yeah. long hair turned up, you're like, wow, well, look yeah. at them. You know, you're like, wow, look at them, look. You know what I mean? You're like, I want to be that. I want to be that. I don't care. I, don't, I want to be him. You know what I mean? So it was like that. Look. So when you landed back in England after that tour, yeah. what was the next steps for you? I, I got myself on the selection. Okay. So I had to literally drive down to... Drive and we're talking what, 97, 98? Yeah, about 97, I think. Okay. Yeah, 97, 97. Yeah, 97. Yeah. So drove down to January 97, drove down to Sandy Bridge. 300 other punters, mass or menace, more or less. Same camp, day one, sign up, you know, you, you're there, you, you, you get assigned your bed and your bunk, and gradually through a process of, you know, four weeks, you do the, the hills phase, they call it, where you just walk every day over the hills and all that sort of stuff, and the bed spaces become yeah. fewer and fewer, okay. do you know what I mean? They just knock them off, ding, 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 Is it literally ding. like knock them off? You, sorry, mate, you're not, you can't handle it, or do they put their hands out and go, you know, I can't handle this no more? Uh, How does it work? It's... It's a it's a it's a combination of both. You know, you could, if you when you get onto the stage where your where your marches are timed, if you don't make one, they'll probably give you a second chance. If you don't make two, you're gone. Okay. But uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. A lot of guys go. Not for me. A lot of guys really? get injured. Like, I mean, it's, 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 it's brutal. You know, you, you're walking all sorts of weathers. You know, great big large packs on your back up and down mountains. You're going to lose a few. And whereabouts in Wales? Few, yeah, in Brecon, in, in okay. Sandy Ridge, and uh, Brecon, and on the Penny Fan, and all that sort of stuff. So it's it's a brutal course. That first four weeks, though. Is really only an aptitude phase because that's just for the for the, they don't even know who you are at the end of that yeah. four, four, four weeks. After that, you then go to the jungle. So you spend another six weeks in the jungle and you start soldiering them properly. You okay. start, you know, but it, it, the weight's probably increased on your yeah. back. You've, you've, you're tactical all the time, and then you've got this thing where it rains rains for at least two or three hours every day. You get completely soaking wet. You've got all the animals and that want you dead. <laughs> Everyone wants you dead in the jungle. Do you know what I mean? And you've got this permanent thing whereby the staff are watching you all the time. So you've got this like sword of Damocles over your head for the whole time that you're in the jungle, do you know what I mean? You can literally, and I've seen it happen, I've seen somebody sort of like laid there in, in first thing in the morning and the DS coming on, right, son, go on, off you go. No, 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 no you're not required anymore. Right, okay. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, not me, not me. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're like that, all right. Yeah. <laughs> You've gone from 300 people in Wales. How many does it go down to before you go um, to the jungle, roughly, can you remember? You've probably lost you probably lost over half of that, just about okay. over half of that, I'd have thought. They, they like to try and keep the numbers up because they've got to justify the flights, yeah. haven't they? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. <coughs> but they do they do lose a good half of that. So you've got a ton 50 more. going to the jungle. Yeah. And how long is that? Six week? A six, yeah, six and weeks. And what, what are you doing in the jungle? Learning the soldier. Okay. It's all the basics. It's just all the basics. Give me stuff. an example. What's the basics? Um, basic patrolling, basic navigation. Um, living in a harbour area, so a harbour area is where you live when you're in the field. So you might have a, you know, dig a little, dig a little pit if you're in the UK. But over there, you've got a little sort of like hammock thing in the trees, has to be packed up every day, and then you stand to and wait for the enemy to come, and then you roll, get on with your day's work. And everything they do is, I say, it's monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. So they do it, they show it to you, you do it, and if monkey keeps on doing, monkey monkey passes yeah. the course, and if monkey don't, monkey goes home. <laughs> like, do you know I mean? Simple as that. And I say that to people now, it's monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. And when monkey stops doing, yeah. see you later, monkey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How hard is it to navigate around a jungle with a compass? It's, look, it's, like, all, must be... it's all done on pacing and bearing. Yeah. It's all done, you know, you've got to trust your compass. Right, you've got to you've got to put that trust in in magnetism, all right? Because yeah. it is going to face north, and you're not, yeah. right? <laughs> I'm not the compass. That is, yeah. that, you'll be amazed how many guys. Ah, it's, 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 it's definitely that way. <laughs> it's like, no, it's mate. Like no, with, it's, it's arguing it's, like arguing with sat nav, isn't it, Ram? Yeah. <laughs> no, mate. No, no. <laughs> look, 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 look. This has been thousands of years. We've got the two poles. It's called magnetism. <laughs> north. <laughs> <laughs> so six weeks. How yeah. brutal was the six weeks compared to the four weeks in Wales? Right. So here's something that. It's tough, yeah, because you are got increased weight on your back with all the kit that you've got to now carry your food for over, all this sort of stuff. So your kit has gone up. Yeah, the terrain is like that. Yeah. It rains every day. You got wet kit, dry kit. You, it's horrendous. Mm. But here's the thing, right? I genuinely enjoyed this phase because I was learning the soldier. Yeah, and I'm doing all the stuff I've seen. I'm, I'm, this is me now. I've, I've yeah. got the gun. I've got the wow. I'm actually I'm a soldier yeah. now. Do you know what I mean? I'm doing it. So I was more sort of like focused on what I was learning and how much I was enjoying it rather than how much my skin tags were hurting on the bottom of my feet, my belt was chafing on my back and all yeah. that sort of stuff. That paled into insignificance. The way it's run, it's designed, if you don't want to be there, you won't stay. Mm. They're not going to encourage you to stay. They're not going to go, come on, come on. They're just going to go, you all right? No, yes, 
Do you know what I mean? Staying? That sort yeah, of thing. Okay. Do you know what I mean? So it's not... You will get found out. If you do not want to be there, you'll get found out. So a lot of the people that come off, although they'll say, oh, I was, I was injured or this, that. Nah. You didn't want to be there, mate. Yeah, okay. Because I can tell you now, you know, I had a, probably had a fractured toe. I'd lost two of my toenails. My back was in pieces. I'd dislodged one of my retinas. So there was lots of things with me that said, Phil, stop. Yeah. But then there was all this stuff saying, no, Phil, carry on, because I want to be that bloke in the car. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. like, that's what kept me going. I wanted to be that man. You know what I mean? So... I was no super soldier. I was not the fittest bloke. You know, they run a sweepstake in the science mess. So I think most of them said I'll be back within about two weeks. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Proved them wrong. Yeah. But so, obviously they saw a mental toughness and you obviously produced a mental toughness, right? I think some of that, that stuff... maybe that you didn't know you had until you got to the jungle. I, that sort of stuff has been in me since I was a kid. When, the, when I was underneath the beatings. Yeah. When I was working out that if I stayed still, all that stuff has built me up. Yeah. All that stuff I learnt when I was being bullied, all that sort of stuff has, has cemented inside me. Yeah. I've pulled nothing but positive out of that. Yeah. I've pulled nothing from all these negatives. I've pulled nothing but positive. So the jungle's extremely tough, but I'm looking on the positive side. I'm going, this is good. Yeah. This is all right. We're learning here. We're doing something positive. This is great. So I'm not thinking about, oh god. That hurt. Yeah. You must have been at your pinnacle of mental toughness then. I don't, in yeah, that, that's in that area, I just, everything that's gone on in your life to get to the jungle and go. Nothing's gonna nothing's gonna phase me right now. No, everything that's happened in my past twenty eight years, I'm at my I'm it's at my all, top right it's now. It's all prepared you. For yeah, that. Okay. it's all prepared you for that. You've yeah. drawn from all these experiences that you've had. Yeah, to make you focused. And guys must have different reasons for me to be there. I wanted to be that man. I yeah. wanted to be the man with the beard and the gun. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I want to be that man because I've seen him. Did you? Too. Is there a lot of piss take? Do you get into other people's minds? Your pal's minds? You're going to fail. You're going to fail. You, or you, or you're Not bigging, so you're bigging each other fail, up. But, you know, I'll tell you what does happen. When I see someone fail, who I thought maybe, I thought he'd have passed. Oh, right, yeah. See ya. See That's one less competitor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And let's be honest, the, the amount of morale that you can draw yeah, out of that, you're yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, he's gone. Yeah, give me a little boost. Yeah. <laughs> so what, happen, what happens after six weeks then? Do you find out then or do you have to fly back and they tell you? No, you st we got told in the trees. So it was us. So you, you go out, we, had a night, we, we got out of the trees and like literally they told you we, we'd finished in the trees and that's it, you've done, you know, pass or fail now, you're not going to do any more in the trees. Yeah. You get picked up by a helicopter. I remember sitting on the skids on the way out. Can the skids? What's the skids? The skids, the side of the helicopter. Side, okay, you know, yeah. So I sat, yeah, yeah. sat on the side of the helicopter. The loadies passed me a can of beer, and I'm sat there coming over the canopy, drinking this can of beer, thinking, well, there's nothing more I can do now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. Well, there is. Yeah. Because you get back to camp, and they throw a bit of a piss up for you. All right? So now you're going to get yeah. get to show them what you can do get when you're it. lashed yeah. up. Yeah. Like, you know, plenty of time to let yourself down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had a proper steaming night that night, I'm telling you. And like in the morning... I'm laid in my pit, like, oh, upside down, pickled, like, do you know what I mean? And I can hear the company, the, the, the squadron clerk coming around, tapping people's bed frames, right, the DS want to see you. I'm like, oh, my God. So you just laid there like that, pretending you weren't there. And then it's less and less and less and less and less and less and less. And then when you worked out, you'd, you'd pass, like, do you know what I mean? Amazing. But then you've got this really bizarre thing where you fly back to the UK and half the plane's failed and half the plane's passed. Oh, no. It's like, look, look at them, like, oh. <laughs> and you want, you, want, you want to go, hey, <laughs> Especially if you didn't like something, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But you can't, you've got to try and keep professionals, yeah. you're like that. Yeah. <laughs> Where, what country is this? Uh, Brunei, but it doesn't mean to say it'd be Brunei, it could be, it could be anywhere that's got a decent stink, honking jungle, yeah. Right, okay. So when you land <coughs> back, what are the movements for you? Do you get moved into, do you get straight back to your... No, you come back, you then do, the, the course continues. I think the officers go away and do a couple of bits and pieces slightly different to you, and then you've got to do some heavy weapons and... Uh, you've still got combat and survival to do. You've got to do your interrogation phase. And I can't go too much into that because I'm not 100% yeah. sure how much I can talk about that, yeah. but all the rest of the stuff's out there. But you've then got a parachuting phase. You've got a phase where you're in all the black kit and all that sort yeah. of stuff. So they build these phases in. Okay. And then sort of like at the end of it all, after you've done your parachute jumps, you get badged. Yeah. And you, you know, you bury and all that sort of stuff. But you've still got a year's probation from there. So once you've passed, you've still got a year's probation. You've still got a year's probation from when you've passed, yeah. Well, you did oh. in my day. It might be slightly different now. I don't yeah. know. But, you know, you did in my day. You had a year's probation mm. once you'd passed. Tell me about the interrogation phase. Uh, I, I, Is it the same as what you see on telly? Dragged about. Stress positions. Lots of screaming. Lots of shouting. Lots of waiting around to be interrogated. Lots of methods they used interrogating you, you know. You get naked, you get searched, you get all that sort of stuff. Do you yeah. know what I mean? A bit of humiliation, you know, what I mean? all that sort of stuff. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, but it, it, when you got to that stage of your training, I'm thinking to myself, well, hang on a minute, I'm nearly there now. Do yeah. you know what I mean? You ain't, ain't going to bust me now. You ain't gonna break no chance yeah. you're going to break me now. Do you know yeah. what I mean? You've got to really smash me up if you're going to want me to come off this course now. Do you mm. know what I mean? But blokes did. Blokes put their hand up enough. So what's this, 98? 97? 97. 97, yeah. 98. And how many years were you in the SAS for? I, I was out by the end. Of, uh, 2001, I got out. I should have four, four years. Yeah, four, yeah four, four, five. Probably five, yeah. And what tours did you go on? Um, we did a bit of stuff over in Bosnia. We did stuff in Sierra Leone. We did stuff... Yeah, we, we, we got around it. Like, we weren't as busy as what they are now. Nowadays, they're insanely busy. They've got work all over the place. I can't even begin to imagine what they're up to yeah. now. Do you know what I mean? They get, they're getting more trigging time than John Wayne. Like, mm, do you know what I mean? Yeah. They're, they're always in a scrap somewhere. Yeah. In my day, it wasn't so much, you know, I, I left at a period where it was just, all that was just about to start. Yeah. So, you know, but the Sierra Leone was a massive job for us. You know, we went over there and rescued those Royal Irish lads. That was, you know, that was a, that was a good punch up and, you know, I, you know, thoroughly tested myself. And What happened that day with the Irish lads? Uh, well, they got it went it went on for quite some time. They mm. got taken on about the twenty fifth of the. When did they get taken? They got about taken on the twenty fifth of August, I think, and it went on the boat. It went into September sometime. Yeah. September the tenth, we rescued them, but they got taken by these you know savage lunatics from Africa. Um, they got you know taken back to their camp. All the normal, you know, mock executions and all that sort of stuff. But we, you know, there was negotiations on from the very start with that job. So there's, there's stuff coming out. You know, they managed to. We had a, it's a proof of life for existence. They, you know, our lot said, "No, we want to see that they're alive." So they came out. One of them shook their hands, handed over a map, all that sort of stuff. It was, it was, it was proper stuff, like do you know what I mean. But it, it went on for quite a bit. And then, like I say, the, the final thing was we went through all these options. Could we get down the river? Could we, could we walk down the, and and. It got called Operation Certain Death in the end because the, the only real option we have is just to fly a helicopter straight into the middle of the camp, jump straight on top of everybody and have it out with them. <laughs> that's, that's, more, that's what we did. <laughs> if, you, if you'd have been on one of your promotion courses in the army and you'd have said, right, I'm going to do that, they'd have gone, right, no, no, right, next. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But yeah, that, yeah. here we were, face with that. Wow. And, and I do laugh because, you know, all this time, this was the first major punch-up I'd ever been in, really. I've been blown up a couple of times in Ireland. I've dodged a couple of bullets down yeah. again, but never never a full-on, right, I'm in your camp, here we go, come and get us. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So. And I remember coming out the back of the chopper and thinking to myself, right, here we go. And just in the back of my mind, you know, you'd always sort of like figured yourself finding a lovely piece of cover to get behind. And yeah, yeah I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll do everyone from here. Like, do you know yeah. what I mean? No, nah, I'm in the middle of a football pitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flat as a pancake. It's going, man, yeah, stuff going <laughs> everywhere. Oh, God, here we go. <laughs> How many men went in for something like that? I can't remember off the top Roughly, of the Roughly. Couple, 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 couple of helicopters were. So you must have been... 20 probably, 25 come out the first one, 20 odd come out of R1 and then it drops them on the other side of the river and that sort of stuff. So there, there wasn't many blokes in the village. You know, talking 60 blokes, 70 blokes tops, so I'd have thought actually having it out in the village. Bloody hell. So it was a, it was a full on day. And was this, done, was this done at what time of day? First light. So first we, had, light. We, had a, we had an observation team which had been sort of like on the edge of the village. So they pushed right up on the moor. We'd done a bit of a cheeky one on them mm -hmm. the night before. So where we was doing all these negotiations... They kept asking for more and more. Well, he'd asked for a couple of boat engines, right? So we thought, right, the night before we go, we'll give them the boat engines because we'll get them back in the morning anyway, right? <laughs> so they dropped, they dropped these two boat engines off, and as a goodwill gesture, it gives them about 50 cases of lager. So the first thing they do is the boat engines go straight straight on the sort of like side of the track. They take these 50 cases of lager back and they get straight, get straight <laughs> on it, don't they? So you know now that, you know, as they hear the bop, 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 bop in the morning, they go, okay. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> soften it up a bit. You know? <laughs> Best tactics I've heard yeah. in my life. Yeah. Get them larruped. Yeah. Yes, man. <laughs> yeah, quality. And then when you come, what's that feeling like being on a chopper? You've set yourself off, you've got a switch in mind on, there's two helicopters coming in, you're flying low, down. Are you grabbing them? Are you fighting? Are you Christ, grabbing the it, Irish straight was, away, getting them straight it was, on? It was crazy. So the team that went in for the Irish, uh, the, 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 the chopper ride itself, right? Yeah. I, I, I always remember, we're going back to the chopper, and the sergeant major gave this big rousing speech about killing everybody in the whole of Africa. Like, you know, he's yeah. like, wow, yeah. you're under no illusions now. You're going to go and have a punch up, yeah. right? At the back of my mind, I'm still thinking, well, this could get called off at some stage because we've been called off so many times before. We're like, okay, all right, yeah, whatever. As we were up in the helicopter, we flew, flew out over Freetown um, and out to sea so that they couldn't hear us like, because we had to wait for these guys to call us in at the best time so we had yeah. the best amount of light. So we, anyway, we're going around this holding pattern, blah, 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 blah. And at this stage, I'm thinking, well, we could still probably get called off here. 
So I'm not really that bothered. Do you know what I mean? I've had all my orders. I know what I'm doing. I'm just sat, I'm, well, I've stood against the thing. I've got my hand on the rope. And I'm like, yeah, all right. And then we get the old thing in our ears. It's like, right, yeah, zero alpha has control. Stand and now we know it's on. Yeah. It's on like Don Juan. We're going yeah. now. This is this is actually, <laughs> this is proper. And I remember that night, before I turned around to have a look at me mate to say, this is good. <laughs> this helicopter just went whoomph and just like fell out of the sky to get into its like attack pattern to come down yeah. the... Shit, I'm telling you what, I must have left half my breath. It's probably still there it's now, been... over Freetown somewhere. Do you know what I mean? There's a sausage floating about. <laughs> I'm like, oh, geez, it's been come out of the sky. And I just remember coming down this riverbank, and at first, I was stood behind my mate, and I'm banging my head, come on, and I'm screaming, I'm going, yes, yes. Do you know what I mean? And as it as we got a two-minute warning, we got like this, the, the, the load is screaming, two minutes, two minutes, and everyone's going, two minutes, and he's like, two, two, two minutes? Two minutes, and we we're, we're, Oh, I better switch on. I better stop hitting me, mate. And start thinking about what I'm doing. And literally, it was like, you're in the zone. And that's it. From that minute on, you remember every last thing you've been told. You, 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 you're just concentrating on nothing but what you need to do when you get out of the helicopter. And when you got out of the helicopter and ended up facing the wrong way, yeah. complete, you know, every, like there's a saying in the army that uh, a contact will only, uh, only contact survives the first five minutes. Do you know what I mean? And after, it's just it's carnage. Yeah. Because it was like, it just didn't go to plan. So no plan survives the first contact. Yeah. And we literally got out of this helicopter and where the ops team had moved up, the, the gaps had filled with someone and they were shooting at us from here and we're like, oh, we never expected that. So we end up facing the wrong way. <laughs> we're in a line that we shouldn't, I should have been there, but I'm not, I'm here and there's people here. And, I'm, and we're shooting this way and that sort of like dies down a bit. And I remember my mate Jim, he's a, he's a, he's a Geordie and he went, we, uh, we, we're facing the wrong way, lads. <laughs> Yeah, nice one, Jim. Yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> we're on this bizarre thing. We're stood up, turned around. And, yeah, right, we're ready. Yeah, wait, come on then. <laughs> and off we went again. Like, do you know what I mean? And this whole, and a, quite an intense fight, getting in and out. And you know, it, it went on for quite a bit, and the, and the whole thing panned out. And we, you say an intense fight. What's an intense fight mean? And how long did it last for? Do you reckon? Do you know off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you exactly how long it lasted for. It's 20, 20, 30 minutes. Wow. Sort of okay. like getting to the edges, waiting for buildings to be cleared, and then we sort of like went silent on the place. And then they're sort of like pulling dead out and, and picking, you know, casualties up. And, you know, a couple of, one of ours had been hit, so he's being taken away and all that sort of stuff. And it kicked off again. So the, the, the locals have obviously run out of the village. And some of them, the way we've gone so quiet, when we, they thought, oh, we'll go back in and see yeah. if we can do them. Like, yeah. you know, started again on the edge of the village. I had a cup of tea by this stage. Mm. And I'm sort of like, RP Army weapon. Like, oh, my God, they're coming. Yeah. <laughs> I had another, had another bit, of a, a bit of a shootout with them there. Mm. So... Then we called a helicopter in and it made sort of like a car park of the whole area around the whole of the forest, like, do you know what I mean? And after that, there was nothing else. They, they, they weren't bothering anymore. And how easy was it to get the Irish lads? How many of them were they? We knew roughly where they were. They had a fair idea that we were coming from the last negotiation. So they were literally under control within seconds of the first boats coming down the rope. So okay. the first helicopter came in, they roped on. Yeah. Ours landed on the football pitch. So we were sort of like supporting each other, but they went straight in. And the guys that were already on the ground who'd been watching it, yeah. well, they're, they're covering the helicopter right, in. So okay. anyone who come out to take the helicopter down, well, they're gone already. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So literally that that piece there, they were on that building, they were in there, and those lads were safe. And then, like I say, they, you had to make sure everything else was clear. And it just, like I say, it took, I don't know, 20, 30, I can't even remember. Oh it was just, it just from the time hitting the ground to the time getting back off it again, do you know what I mean? And... Just What's that feeling like when you've done a job, you've taken what you had to do, what you have to do, you've got your, you got your men back on the you uh, choppers, and when you get back... You go through so many emotions in yeah, one day yeah. on something like that. So there's all the build-up. Obviously, you're going to be a bit nervous. You're going to be sort of like thinking there's going to be anticipation. Yeah. There's going to be a bit of worry. It was my son's birthday that day, so I'm like, oh, be typical. I've got done on me, on me yeah. boys. But so you've got all this stuff going through your mind. You've then got, you've then got to have extreme focus for what you're about to do. You can't let all this other niff-naff and trivia sidetrack you. You've got to think about what you're doing. Then when you're on the ground, and I remember getting told that Brad had been killed. Brad was a very good friend of mine. I got told sort of like 10 minutes after we'd finished the first lot of fighting proper, you know, Brad's dead. And I'm like, furious. Yeah. Absolutely furious. Thinking to myself, give me another one. Just give me anyone. Yeah. Just give me one of them. Yeah. And I'll do them with my hands. Like, yeah. I'm mean, absolutely mad angry. I call it battlefield angry. If mm. you got that angry in Civvy Street, you get locked yeah. up for a very long time. Like, yeah. I mean, proper angry and then like it calmed down again and then it was like you're on the helicopter you're on your way back out of there and you get this like feeling of it's like the glad to be alive clap yeah. it's like wow wow I'm here I've survived it 
in the knowing that other people probably haven't fared as well as you have. So there's a little bit of guilt in there as yeah. well. Do you know what I mean? So there's all these emotions. You must go through every emotion the mm. human body possibly has in one day. You know, that night I mean, we had a few beers on one of these RFA ships. It's just incredible experience. The whole thing was, you know, and this thing, that was just one firefight. Some of these lads who've been doing that Afghanistan, right, doing that almost every yeah. day, like, do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It was a phenomenal experience. Did you enjoy that, Buzz? I did enjoy the bus, yeah. yeah. I did, I did enjoy it. That day was a phenomenal day. You know, I'll be honest, you know, some of it is, some of it, some of it you wouldn't wish on people. You know, I, I don't want, I don't want it to ever have to get that angry with people. Do you know, I don't, didn't enjoy that side of it, you know, finding out that, you know, Brad wasn't going to be coming back, it was all that sort of stuff. But the actual buzz of going through that, mm. the buzz of all, all the hype and, the, you know, coming off the back of that chopper straight into that firefight, boom, 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 yeah. boom. Yeah, even though we're facing the wrong way, I don't yeah. care. <laughs> I don't care. Just, I'm going to fight him. <laughs> do you know what I mean? We're doing it. Do you know what I mean? Crazy. How long were you in Sierra Leone for? Uh, probably about 10 days, I suppose. Yeah, not long. In and out to do that job? In and out, literally, in and out. Job done, go home. We literally, uh, I swear, uh, within, within half a day of coming out of that village, I'm on a flight going back to the UK. Do you know what I mean? Within a day, I'm walking around Sainsbury's. You know what What's I mean? that feeling like, though? There's no, de was, there's no decompression. You're going straight back into Civvy Street. That was strange. And I remember going into the interest And this was before mental health was a massive yeah. thing, of course. And I remember going into the interest room and one of the one of the troop staff, he's just turned around and said something like, anybody got a problem with that? No, I didn't think so. Do you know what I mean? And it was almost like, I felt there was a little bit of lip service being paid to people who potentially could have had a lot of problems with, 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 with what had happened in that village. And there was some unpleasant stuff happened in there. Like, do you know what I mean? So, mm. I don't know, it was a little bit, it was a little bit brash, a little bit, a little bit too old school for me, if you like. That was, and like I say, the feeling of, the feeling of them walking around, just walking around Sainsbury's. After having been sort of like, you know, wading through a honking village, do you know what I mean? Seeing the stuff you'd seen and all the rest of it and thinking, uh, salted beans or what, be what yeah. beans am I having today? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That was quite a strange one. Do you know what so, I mean? So and, I mean, if you came back with one of those long tours, you would probably, I would hope, yeah. get some sort of decompression. But that was such a job that it was like, just home, there you go, you're back on whatever you were doing. Mm. And, right, back to work then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that, wow. And then what do you do when you land back and you're back in Civvy Street again? Are you waiting for a call again? Are you waiting for the next yeah, job? there is a there is a standby squadron. I mean, I, I don't know how it works now. I'd imagine it's fairly busy because they've got stuff on all over the place. But in my day, you sort of like went back on the stand. And if you weren't on, if you're on standby, you did a bit of training, so you turn up on the ranges in the morning, do a bit of that. You just keep the wheels rolling, keep yeah. yourself greased up and ready to go, like all the times. You know I mean, and if you're lucky enough to get a shout, you got the shout. You went and did your bits and pieces. You came. Out. Sometimes there'd be a shout, and some would go, and others would stay behind. That's an horrible one, isn't yeah. it? Like that, all your mates are out there, guts and glory, and you're sort of like sat in there going, I wonder when they'll be back. I hope, <laughs> I hope, I hope nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> I hope nothing happens. <laughs> what was? Tell me what Bosnia was like. Um, I didn't do a massive amount of time in Bosnia, but in and out it, it, again, it was a it was a civil war-y type thing. There was some disgusting stuff going on. Do you know like what? what? I mean? Like war what? crimes. You know, people being executed, kids being killed. We heard all sorts of stuff going on behind the scenes. Some disgusting, horrible creatures. And what war zones do throw up is disgusting, horrible creatures. Like, do you know what I mean? And they thrive in these places, mm. and they become the warlords and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, well, I can't go too far into it. But one of the things that we used to go would we we'd go and arrest we call them Pithwicks, persons, persons indicted wanted for war crimes. So we were picking up the worst of the worst. We were going in there to get them out, do you know yeah. what I mean, and, and arrest them. But we'd, we'd do it in a number of different ways. Do you know what I mean, but I, I, I tell you, they would always be set up. They'd always be taken where there was minimum exposure to us. So we'd be snatching them off the side of the street or yeah. out of their bed at night or, or whatever it happened to be. Do you know what I mean, we'd line them up, tee them up properly first and then go and get them so that there was less exposure to yeah. us. So we didn't really, you didn't get in too much trouble doing that, do you know what I mean? They, they, you know, we did, you know, one of our lads got shot doing it, but no, no, I don't think we ever lost anybody doing those. They were really, you know, just get in, get them, get out, and you'd do it at a time and choosing of your convenience. And, you know, the old saying, you know, a well-timed, prepared and planned ambush gives the enemy maximum opportunity to die gallantly for his country, like, do you know yeah. what I mean? And that's what we would do, we'd tee them up properly, mm. like, do you know what I mean? So, and yeah. what, was the, what are the rules about shooting someone and not shooting someone? Depends, again, it depends where you are. It, but the, the, the sort of like, Baseline rule is if, because they'll always be like, they, they had cards written in Iraq with all the rules and Northern Ireland had the yellow card and all that sort of stuff. But the basis premise will be if somebody's using a weapon in such a way that endangers you or others and to, and to not do something about it would put other people's lives in danger, then obviously we're, we're up and we're rolling. Like, do you know mm. what I mean? So you've got, you've got to use your... Who's going to prove that? Well, nowadays, <laughs> everybody, isn't they? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's more cameras than that nowadays. Yeah. So... You know, I mean, guys are even some some guys. I would imagine nowadays are wearing cameras. Mm. 
So, <coughs> yeah. What was the what was Iraq and Iran like? Iraq and Afghanistan, I did, but as a city. So I went out there. When I got out of the regiment, and I got out under a bit of a cloud, you know, I had a bit of a row downtown, I had a couple of bits and pieces going on, and I bought my way out, I paid my way out. And I went, bearing in mind that year we'd come back from, the year before we'd come back from Sierra Leone, I didn't think it was ever going to get any better than that. Yeah. I didn't know that that lunatic was going to fly planes into the towers and it was going to be war for 10 or 15 mm. years to come. I got out. And I literally got in the civvy street and it was like a proper halt for me. Like, do you know what so I mean? let's just roll back here a minute. Ago, a minute. Yeah. You had a bit of a tear up and stuff. Yeah. What happened there? Um, I had a, I had a bit of an argument downtown. Come back the police. Whereabouts were you? In Hereford. Hereford. Okay. Yeah, I'd had a bit of a tear up in one of the pubs in Hereford. Come back to my house. Had an argument back back there. Um, the, the police had come to town. I smashed a window and stuff and just gobbed off when they come to get me. And then they took me downtown. I'd come back and the sergeant major said, "Look, I, I don't know if I can stand up for you on this one. Like, do you know what I mean? It may have gone a bit too far and." All that sort of stuff. Mm. It wasn't. It wasn't particularly pleasant. And I, you know, I, 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 I've always been one of those who's never far. <laughs> I'm always close to the bones. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm, I'm a checkered past. An officer would say, yeah. like, do you know what I mean? So, I just thought that I'm now going to be in a position where even if I get away with this, even if they keep me, yeah. which I didn't think they probably would, even if they did keep me, then it would be a, a case of, you know, you're, you're second in the queue now. Yeah, okay. And I've just seen someone, a very good friend of mine, just recently. You know, he's hoping to get get promoted to start major because he has gone the distance but everybody's leapfrogging him because they've all got their long service good conduct medals and he hasn't yeah. I don't know there'd be more chance than Nelson getting his eye back than me yeah. getting long service good conduct <laughs> you know what I mean there'd be no chance <laughs> so you know I, I knew that that was going to catch up with me at some stage I was still a fairly young bloke I knew that I could earn good money in Civvy Street because there was all this bodyguarding going on yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, no, I'll just take the plunge. So you start... didn't, but you didn't know when you said, "Well, I've had enough of this." You thought, you know what? I'm going to be second in the queue. Yeah. I want out. You said you had to pay yourself out. Yeah. How, I had to how, be, much, I had how to much you got to pay to get out? Do you know what? Roughly. A monkey. Okay. All right. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Okay. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't okay. a lot. They owed me a bit of dough at the end. So of anyone listening out there, it's five hundred quid. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Buy buy yeah. yourself out. Yeah. You're out. <clears throat> When you bought yourself out, was the ninety? Was nine eleven? Was that pre nine eleven? No, post no. 9/11? I literally, I got out on the first of that month of September. Was the first of September, I got out. Two thousand and one. Yeah, and on the ninth, we know what happened. Do you know what I mean? And it all went off, and I'm like, eleventh, oh. eleventh, eleventh. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. 9th. On the eleventh yeah, yeah, yeah. ninth, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So on the eleventh, it all goes off, and I'm like, ah, oh, you fool! What have you done? Like, do you know what I mean? But then I think to myself, well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. There's going to be a whole heap yeah. of work in Afghanistan. There's yeah. going to be this is going to buffer on all around the world. There's going to be there's going to be workforce like this. So I got myself in a position where I ended up in Afghanistan really early days, running the security for a for a European embassy, earning good money. When I first got out, I went to this. I, I literally I got out and I'd I'd run out of money. Give me an example of how much dough you were on in as uh, in the SAS roughly. Talk, twenty we were talking twenty three years ago, twenty four years. Twenty three years ago, you'd be lucky if you went home with eighteen hundred quid, two grand in the bank a month. Wow. So it wasn't a lot. Wow. And I was terrible with money anyway. I just yeah. worked mine out in beans and, yeah. and beer. Do you know yeah. what I mean? That yeah, was yeah, it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, yeah, obviously, it, as you went through the I was only a trooper, though. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So I wasn't earning the massive money. Um, when I got out, I ran out of money. Yeah. I had no money. <clears> I went to the job centre. And this is, a lot of people would have heard this story, but I went to the job centre and I knew you could get these crisis loans. And I see all these lunatics getting these crisis loans and walking out with these green ships going, oh, I thought, oh, I'll ask someone that. So, yeah. yeah, 78 pound or something it was. So I go to, I go to the job centre. Woman sits in front of me like we are now. Yeah, yeah name, yeah, field campion, yeah, address, blah, 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 blah. Uh, what have you been doing? For, yeah, I'm an underwater knife fighter. Uh, steely eyed bringer of death. Um, do you know, with all, these, all this blagging coming out of me, you know, yeah, I'm a demolitionist, I'm a government yeah. assassin. All, yeah, but what do you actually do? Well, I kill people, obviously, love. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> She's not having none of it, right? But what qualifications have you actually got? Um, well, none of my army qualifications transpired and it was just a waste of time. So I've now got a cycle proficiency. That's it. That's all I've got. So she says, what kind of work do you want to do? I said, well, security of some sort. She said, oh, okay. She said, I'll put all your work, all your stuff in the computer. She said, we'll see what comes out. And to get this loan, I had to say I was going to go yeah. on, this, on this interview. Right? Yeah. So she, puts, <laughs> she comes back and she goes, right, I've got a job in Margate. She goes, there's an interview going on, um, on, on, on next Monday, week Monday or so. What's happening? Lollipop man. <laughs> Oh, no, really? Really, Lollipop Man? So the, the, the government assassin yeah, yeah, yeah. didn't display it. <laughs> so I'm lined up and then to get this, to get my hands on one of those green bits yeah. of paper, I've got to sign the paper going, yeah, I'll be there. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. I'll take some paper. Luckily, before that interview came up, because she, she'd said in the interview, what, what do you want to learn? Earn a year? And I said, 50 grand. She laughed at me. Mm. I swear she laughed at me. Right. So 
that week, a friend of mine phoned me up, says, there's a job going in Afghanistan. It's 55 grand a year. I said, can you get me the contract over? Yeah. He says, yeah. I said, right, I've got the contract. Walks back down to the, to the, um, to the job centre. Bloke says, right, I'll see you now. I said, no, you won't. I said, I want to see her. All right, you'll have to wait now. I said, yeah, I'll wait. Yeah, this bloke. No, you want to, no, no, I want to see her. So I waited for an hour, give her this piece of paper. There. And it was like she was gutted, devastated. Well, you can earn 55 grand, yeah. Yeah. I told you, there you go, 50, Quality. I wanted 55. I yeah, I'll take an extra 10%. Gutted, <laughs> devastated. Yeah. Like I've just taken half her dinner, yeah. like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so what was the movement there then? The movement for you, you got a contract. Yeah, I got, got a contract. How long a, for? a company called Saladin. It was, a, it was a contract for about a year, I think. Um, Who was heading that up? Well, Someone so there British? Was a, there, there, was a, there was a company in the UK, a, 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 one of these companies in the UK that, that, that provides security yep. at high level. Uh, they headed it up. It was working directly to the European Commission. They had an ambassador in Iraq, in in uh, in Kabul, yeah. who couldn't. De- he was Danish, and the Danish never had an army team that they could send. Yeah. So he he said, right, well, I've worked with these people before, mm. this Saladin company, and they literally they they got the contract, farmed it out. There was me originally. There was me. There was two of us were ex SAS. Yeah. There was another guy who was an ex legionnaire, and another guy who was an ex paratrooper, and we just went out and like that kept me going for about. Two and a half, three years, I think. Wow. Done all right out there. Happy days, mate. Yeah, it was you, all you right. Doubled, you doubled your salary from SAS. What, well, you're probably on 20 or grand. Mate, and the little oh, kicks back you can make yeah, when you're out there. Like, you know but, I mean? but you jumped at 55 from leaving. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm shifting. As soon as I get out there, I'm I'm, I'm dealing everything. I bought myself a little motorbike. I'm shifting ammunition out one door. I'm buying <laughs> guns in the next, you know what I mean? I'm doing the whole lot. You know? <laughs> it's a war zone. I'm like, this is my town now, do you know what I mean? I'm all right with that. <laughs> What was the day to day like for you out there? Like getting up, what was the day look from the moment you get up to the moment you went to it bed? It could be anything. It could be the ambassadors just wanting to go and see President Hamad Gaza. You'd go and take him there. He might get invited to a gig. You'd go and take him out there. You could be, he, he might, so a couple of times he flew me up to Mazar. So I'd go and take, take stuff up to Mazar Sharif. I drove up there. So it was so varied. It, mm. it was a good job, you know, and I mm. enjoyed myself. And I was very lucky to get that sort mm. of work, you know. And in the early days, the money was quite good as yeah. well. So you were getting decent money. You were doing a half decent job. It wasn't the same as the regiment, but yeah. you know, you might you might get a little bit of trigger time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Do you know? You might get lucky, <laughs> but you know, you might not. So, yeah, it was all right. I, those days were good, and I had good fun. And how did that come? How did that three year deal come, contract come to an end? Um, I left. I I I, I handed my cards and I went to Iraq. Just someone offered me some more money in Iraq, and I thought, right, I've, I've done three years here. I've disappeared to Iraq. Started working in Iraq, did a similar thing, went around the bases there, worked for several companies, several different people. And then it, it, it was called the circuit in those days, but I call mm. it, it's more like the circus now, like, do you know what mm. I mean? There's, there's, all, there's all sorts going on on there, but it was decent. Some of it was decent work, some of it was absolute garbage. I mean, I sat on, a, sat on a Skylink camp in Iraq once for nearly six months, I didn't go to the gate once. Right. The contract was looking after these engineers that refused to come, I got paid for nothing for six months. Mm. <laughs> Were you happy getting paid to do nothing, or would you rather be active? I'd sooner be active, but if you want to pay me for doing nothing, I'm quite happy with that. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Ask any pre- Premiership footballer that sits on the bench. Yeah, you're happy. Yeah, yeah I'm no, happy. Sure. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and we won't fire off yeah. their money sometimes. Yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, we're doing all right. And then, so we're talking 2001. Done four years in Afghan. Another three years. Uh, sorry, three years in Afghan. Yeah, three years in Iraq. Years, Iraq. Then I started going into places like um, I went to Jerusalem. I went to Gaza. I went to the West Bank. I run a couple of training teams over there with the United Nations. Um, did a little bit of I call it hobby gardening, looking after the stars and stuff. Um, what yeah. sort of stars? Oh, I did everything. I've, did, I've done Dizzy Rascal. I've done Led Zeppelin. We did. <laughs> we did one. It was the Rimmel supermodels, and we got a old bus full of supermodels, and we're driving around um, like these big shopping arcades, and they're all sitting there with the lipstick on, like you know what I mean. <laughs> Just and I had to sit on the bus with them, like, do you know what I mean? Just tough, to make sure, tough yeah, yeah, gig real, that one. real tough gig. <laughs> that one, you know I mean? And I remember thinking to myself, well, they, they were all a lot younger than me then. And I remember putting, um, I put Monty Python on on the bus, <laughs> and none of them understood it. I thought, what's all this about? That's not funny. I'm like, this is the funniest it's thing the ever. Best thing Monty I... Python. That is like, how is that not funny? What is wrong with you, lot? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so just go back there, Jerusalem. <clears throat> what on earth is Jerusalem like? Great, lovely yeah. place. Yeah, what I had a great, it? Like great a, time. How uh, do you explain it, somehow? Um. I've got a great photograph to explain Jerusalem. It's me taking a selfie in a riot. It's an awesome photo. In a riot. I'll, I'll send it to you after this. <laughs> Let me riot selfie. Um, I was working for an office which had Tony Blair and a couple of other dignitaries were coming in and out. We were providing a bit of security for it. 
Um, doing a bit of tra- it was easy days. Compared yeah. with lots of places, it was easy. Where it did get hard was, the, you know, trips into the Gaza that we made later on and subsequently ended up on a team that ended up in Gaza full time. And that was quite difficult because the Gaza Strip was a completely different animal. Do you know what I mean? It really was a completely different so animal. So explain to me what the Gaza Strip's like. Just, it's... People say it's the worst place you've ever been, and the Gaza Strip is right up there with them. You know, once you're in, the first job I went in on, we had all United Nations accreditation. The second job I went in on, we'd lost all that accreditation and we're working directly for a civilian company, right. and it was just murder. I mean, we got chased out of there twice, but you can't get chased out of Gaza because you can't just run over to the wall because you'll get killed. Yeah. So we had to literally we hid in it, hid in bait ditches. Oh, it was just horrendous. We had a, we had a real, yeah, a real a couple of real scrapes in there, all trying to work out this this security for this rebuild of a of a power station that the Israelis had smashed and yeah it was it was a it was a tough old gig. And you were trying to protect that? We were trying to protect the engineers. So right, what had okay. happened was yeah. there was a bit of what I think they call it an infotard or whatever. It's, it's somewhere where they end up scrapping everybody. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it happens all the time out there. You know? like, you'd need the brain of a small planet to understand yeah. Middle Eastern politics. Yeah. But basically there was a group called FATA. Yeah. And they'd been sort of like capacity building in Gaza and they were getting on the right with the Israelis and nobody else in Gaza liked them. Um, so they got overrun. Now, we'd been working for Fatah and we'd been helping them on a, on, a, on a border crossing point and we'd been helping liaise between them and the Israelis so that they could get the gear in and out of Gaza and it was all going really well. Anyway, Hamas executed all the blokes that we were work, that we'd trained. So they, they executed them all. They, they killed a lot of them. Who executed them? Hamas, who were on the axis of evil. They were one of the groups with inside right. Gaza. They executed these guys. Then we get a call from a civvy company saying, look, the only people that have got accreditation to go back into Gaza, because they, they, they shut the borders and said no one's coming in unless they've got accreditation. Well, we had accreditation to go back in, but we'd been training these guys. So I'm like, wow, this is going to be this is yeah. going to be quite cheeky. So the Israelis, in response to them kicking off at the border, malleted the power station in a place called Deir al-Bala, smashed it to pieces. The only people capable of mending that were these Swedish lunatics, okay? These these meatball crunching lunatics from Sweden who were like who knew nothing but they could mend power stations, right? They were completely on the piss the whole time, but they could mend power stations, right? So they flies them up, they goes, We're not going in there unless we've got proper round eyed security. We're not we're not trusting them to do it. So they farmed it out to a civvy company who gets hold of us. The United Nations didn't want nothing to do with it. No sort of like nation, Sweden weren't capable of it anyway. So they're now in a position where if they want to go in there, They've got to have something. Yeah. So we ended up, through default, almost naming our price. Because I know if I go back in there, I could be potentially on the watch list yeah. from, from Hamas and they could want me. So we went back in, we had a series of meetings, we got them back in. Um, but then we got attacked while we were in there by, I think, Islamic Jihad detectors. And there was a couple of other bits and cheeky stuff going on. We knew that we had to get out of there. So we basically sort of like, when the thing was finished, we told them we had to go out to get some kit. And we got, <laughs> went out and never come back again. Like, See ya. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone that, do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a, yeah. But it's just, look, those sorts of jobs, they were dangerous. And the other thing was, you know, you've got no backup when you do stuff like that. Mm. All right, the office might have you back to a certain degree, but, mm. you know, I'd always joke that, you know, I'd, I'd sign out, I'd tell Wendy where I was going because yeah. she's the only one who cares, like, yeah. do you know what I mean? So, yeah. how many, Give me a rough idea how many men you were working with there. We had a team of, we had a team of six, I think. Six? Yeah. And I'd say there was nowhere to go if it went wrong. If, yeah, and it did go wrong. There was nowhere to go. We ended up hiding in the back, back of this old UN compound when we got chased out of the, the power station the first time. Horrendous. Just nowhere to go. You're like, wow. Bloody hell. Yeah. And like I say, the Israelis, they, 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 so we had, a, we had some Hamas guys and they were getting attacked by the Israelis who were they, they're trying to protect us. The Israelis are attacking them. You know, they're throwing these. I remember this one day, we, I was walking down to the guard room. Boom, boom, massive bang. I'm like, wow. Got down there, sort of like crawled in. Why? What's going on? Some guy tried to send some missile over to over to Israel and just blown up in a corner. <laughs> you know, a pair of steaming boats and that. Like, oh wow! He made a right man. Just a pink mist everywhere. Like, you know, like wow! Well done. Did mate. you have this sort of attitude we're chatting now when you were in it, going, you know what? I've got to laugh at this. It, yeah, look, yeah. one of the one of the key requirements for any for anybody who needs to join who wants to join the SAS, and it was actually David Sterling wrote a thing called his ethos. Yeah. And the very last thing on his ethos is a sense of humour. You need to have a sense of humour. Yeah. You need to find some of this stuff funny. Do you know what I mean? And some of it's quite dark, some of it's quite, you know, probably not funny to a lot mm. of people, but you need to be able to find something in it because mm. you 
I don't think I could do it unless I could find a little bit of a yeah human man. little bit of a Fair play, <laughs> little bit of an angle Fair in there. Play, like, do you know what I mean? What was your movements when you come back from there? It could be anything, could, you know. Could, you know, don't forget. What about, the, a, what about the pirates? What about the pirates on ships and stuff? So the pirates and stuff. That... So again, I get a phone call of a friend of mine. He says to me, he goes, uh, he goes, our oh, pirates down in some. And I'm imagining. What year are we talking <coughs> now? Two mid two thousands. Two thousand and five, two thousand and six, okay. seven, yeah. probably. Yeah. So I've got this image in my mind of some swashbuckling lunatic with a sword in one eye and yeah, a parrot on his yeah. shoulder. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm like, what is all that about? So I phone up, goes, he goes, no, 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 Somali pirates. He explained it to me. He said, you know, Somali pirates, they're taking ships. I'd read a little bit about it, seen a little bit. He, I, he says, look, can you go down? He says, do a job for me down there. I said, yeah. He says, you're going to be taking a ship from Muscat, I think, down to, down to wherever it was going. I can't remember. So it goes down the very first, I remember the very first one. I turns up, right? I swear, I turn up um, down in Muscat. And he promised me, he goes, you're going to get bright razor wire you're going to get this you're going to get a whole thing of stores so this agent met me like the shipping agent Gak they met me I said right can we go and get the stores uh, what stores Mr. Phil uh, you know the stores for the ship you know the the, the what wire Mr. Phil you know the wire wire the wire wire for the ship I'm going to be with the pirates and that no 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 Mr. Phil there's nothing here Mr. Phil so I phones up the office I phones up I, says, I, I try to see all this guy all day nothing nothing at all I managed to get hold of him with about sort of like an hour ago before we're supposed to sail. I says, I says, Will, there's nothing here. There's nothing now. I says, I says, what are we supposed to do? And his exact words were, nobody said it was going to be easy, mate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Anyway, this guy turns up. He's got a, he's got a roll of like gardening twine. <laughs> um, Mr. Phil, I have the wire. Yeah, thanks, mate. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I'll just hang myself. <laughs> <laughs> on the ship and we're all right, like, do you know what I mean? But the ships were a good laugh then, so yeah. you weren't allowed weapons in the early days. You weren't days. allowed weapons on no, the ship? No, in, in the early days it was no weapons, right? So we sort of like come up with, it was like being on, a, you know the A-team? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they never had weapons either, did they? Yeah. But they were all right, yeah, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So we thought, no, we'll be the A-team. Yeah. So we're on the ship, get the old boasting out with the old welder and that, we're welding spikes, we're filling up drums with petrol and throwing flares at stuff, do you know what I mean? Brilliant. Brilliant! Just anything you can do to make. To, we're greasing all the stairwells and that. You know, yeah. you know, it, it, I would have prayed for a pirate to get my ship. Do you know what I mean? And then just watch him. Like, did, 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 did. <laughs> it would have been hilarious. I'm like, no word of a lie. This would be the funniest thing ever. So, <laughs> so we, we, we're doing all this stuff to ships. It was great. And like I say, we. We, for, the, for five years, I probably spent doing that. I spent probably five minutes in the gaze of pirates. Do you know oh, what I mean? Okay. So it wasn't very often. But, the, you know, the, the one time that I always talk about was the one where I ended up throwing the fridge at them. Do you know what I mean? And we run out of everything. So <laughs> I start, so I get us on the ship, and I can't remember where it was. I can't remember if I got on in Mauritius or somewhere like that. Anyway, we're coming up, we're coming the reverse way back up to Egypt. And as we get through, there's a, like a corridor where the, where the Navy used to escort you. We get to the end of that. Of course, the pirates know the Navy are going to, and so they, that's where they get you. Yeah. So we're going along. I've got the guy that goes with me. He's a drunk. He, he, he spends his whole time drinking. The captain's a Russian. He does the same thing. He's petrified of pirates. Yeah. So it's basically me, the first officer, and a couple of others doing everything on this ship. All, right? all the watches, all this. But my mate's completely drunk the whole time. He doesn't want to come out of his, his scratcher. He's not very well. He, he, he's making every excuse he can. So I said, well, you just stay down there. As we come out through um, thingy, the ships disappear. About an hour later, I'm like that. Oh god, you can see them. They're there, aren't they? You know, just two little, two little boats bobbing about. Yeah. Mm, and they're getting sort of like closer and closer. And every time I look at the, every time I look at the the the, the radar, it's like, oh yeah, they are definitely okay. coming. So I says to the, I says to the, to the, to the first officer, right, change direction. He changes direction, look at the thing. Yeah, they change direction. You know, it's definitely yeah, yours. Yeah. It's happening. It's on. Yeah. So. We know they're going to outrun us. They're doing about 25 knots. We're doing about 12. Within an hour, they're there. Yep. All right? Now, we always had this thing where we said, if they come, in the early days, in the early days, it wouldn't work later on because they started using motherships, but in the early days, we used to say, right, if these little boats come along, right, obviously you've got these people, they're not really trained soldiers. Yeah. They've got all the guns. They've got AK-47s, but you've got some flip-flop wearing shepherd in a boat that's doing <laughs> 25 knots. What is he going to hit? Do you know what I mean? He's, he's, he's going to pray and spray. <laughs> He ain't going to eat nothing. So what am I going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stand on the side of the ship with a homemade wooden gun and try and get him to shoot at me because I, I just want to know that he's got no gun, no, no, no ammunition yeah, left. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because he can't carry a lot of ammunition in there. Yeah. And the other thing he can't do is he won't have the world supply of fuel either. So the longer I can keep him chasing about, the more I can get him to fire his gun, the less chance he's got of getting me if he gets on the ship. Yeah. So 
We give him the run around a little bit. We've got a couple of flares. I pff, let him have the first one. It goes nowhere near him. Yeah, he gets a bit keen. He's, like, hey, hey, hey. he's worked us out. He's got me in. I want it. Like, look at that. Yeah, we got you, mate. So he comes a bit closer. Another flare. Pff, now he's like, whoa, I'll tell you what, he's serious with his flares. Do you know what I mean? So he comes out again. His mate comes in. He manages to get to the side of the ship, but right, we, we had barbed wire, we had like all the hoses out, so the only bit that we couldn't really cover properly was right underneath where the bridge wings are out, so yeah. I'm looking over the edge, and he's looking, at, he's, he's, he's trying to get this, and I'm like, oh, I've got nothing. we've thrown nuts and bolts at him, we've got nothing left, we've got nothing left, and I'm like, oh, God. The, the, the crew have gone, they're in the bottom of the ship somewhere, the, 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 the boatswain, he's out there, he's, the boatswain was quite a geezer, like, yeah, you know what I mean, but yeah, he's yeah. like, what do we do? I'm like, I don't know. I runs into the bridge to see if I've got anything left I can throw at this lunatic before he gets on, all right? And the captain used to have a little fridge, you know, those little yeah, travel fridge yeah, type yeah. things. He got one of those in the corner of the in the corner of the thing. It's full of cokes. So I opens it, tips the cokes out, rips his thing out the wall, gets down there, and I think, well, I've got one chance with this. I've got one chance with this fridge, right? Looks over the edge. I'm like, all right, okay. He's definitely on. He's, he's trying to get his ladder on, but the ship's going. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, all right, okay. what I'm going to do is I'm going to yell at him first, right? I'm going to scream at him first. So I lean over. Hey! <laughs> right? He looks up, like, oh. and as he looks up, I'm like, I'm oh, back. <laughs> His fridge comes rattling down the side of the middle. Boom. I miss him, right? But it hits he hits where he's hooked on. It knocks it severs the piece of rope off, right? Yeah. And his boat like drifts back. And he looks out and he must think to himself, I'll tell you what, I'll give this one a miss. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm out of here, like, do you know what I mean? Mate. And with that, with that they head, they they turn tail and they disappear like that. Like, <laughs> I'm out. Uh, How many men were paid to go on these ships with you? Um, on that particular one, it was just me and another lad. On other ones, I'd done it with teams of six. Some then started doing it with, like, they'd take a load of lads from Sri Lanka, so they'd pay them sort of like a, a bag of rice and a flip-flop for each trip, and you'd get 50 quid a day. Or, do you know what I mean? It, it went that way. And then they started getting weapons, and then it started getting... So as soon as the weapons came on, that was a bit of an equaliser. But then they got motherships. So they'd turn up with a mothership, all the heavy guns and all that sort of okay. stuff. But by the time it started going that way, I didn't really... I, I was getting out of there then, really, okay. do you know what I mean? Give me an example of the size of ship you were on. Ooh. Some of the we're talking a big, super massive tankers. super tank. Okay, so, so and what were they carrying on there? Oil, palm oil, grain. So the big, the big ships. Yeah. The ones that weren't so affected were the car carriers because they could do about twenty-five knots, and they were so high. You'd never, you, you, I'd pay to see them try and yeah. get on that. Um, cruise liners again. You know, cruise liners have got fifteen hundred staff underneath it. Do you know what yeah. I mean? They are not letting you get on there. Yeah. So they and they can a cruise liner will do about twenty-six knots as well. Do you know what I mean? So they can power their way through it. Um, the car carriers, um, some of the some of the bigger ships weren't so affected, but they were mainly after these coaster type or or the oil the oil, the oil ships because they were low to the, they got the low freeboards. Yeah, okay. So they can get on them all right. So the Somalians who were succeeding were jumping on the ships. Yeah. Getting rid of whoever was on there, nicking the boat or at ransom. No, take, no, 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 so, no, no. So the crew is the worth. Right, okay. No one cares about the ship. Lloyd's insure the ship. Insure, okay. No one cares about the ship. No one cares about the oil. No one cares about anything on the ship apart yep. from the crew, right? Right. So the crew is the worst. So the Somalis know this. So what they do is they take the ship. We, <laughs> we took a ship back called the Nexus, right? So someone says to me, I've got this job going on at the moment. He says, um, and I went over, to, I flew over to Thailand where the, where the ship's crew were and got in on the negotiations and they're talking away. They would wanted something like 25 million right. for the crew back. Well, they got them down to about four and a half. And then a friend of mine... Four and a half, they got into four and a half mil. Four and a half million, they, yeah. Did they pay it? Right, so here's a funny story. Okay. So a mate of mine used to have a plane in Kenya, and he, and, and he used to fly, his, fly their ransoms out. He loses the first one. He loses the first bag of money. Never gets picked up, never gets seen again. Right? So that bag of money goes. So he gets another bag of money, right? <laughs> Drops... It's his eight million into a hole now, yeah. all right? But it's insured the first lot, right? Yeah. Drops it out, they get it, and the deal was... That they were gonna, we were gonna go out and meet the ship in case more pirates tried because they could literally those lots could get off and then they sort of go right on. Yeah. Get, lads, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, they managed to get, I managed to get an American ship that was in the area. I said, can you give them a bit of cover through a friend of a friend? He give them a bit, a bit of cover, and this ship come back and we got it to Mombasa. When it got to Mombasa, I'm telling you now, Mombasa they, in Kenya. Yeah, 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 yeah. They'd lived on this ship. Yeah. The pirates had lived on the ship, but they'd been too scared to go downstairs, so they'd been using all the sort of like rooms that you could get out as toilets. They'd been living on the decks. They'd sh imported all this cattle. I've never seen a ship in a, in a worse condition in my life. The crew, the crew were, were, were just so relieved to be off it. Yeah. Apart from one, yeah. there was the, the ship's mate was a cross dresser. 
<laughs> and he'd fallen in love with the with the Somali pirate. <laughs> and he, was, he he actually took offence to us taking him off. He's like, no, 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 I go back, I stay. No, 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 mate, you can't. No, 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 we got your ticket, you're going home. No, oh, I stay. I'm going to stay. I, I, I love, love long time with Sam. <laughs> so we're like, we're like, no, 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 no. So we go, apparently, in the long run, he did go back. Yeah. Anyway, so, did we, we, so we've got this ship, we've got them off, they've gone back, they've sent a new captain over, and he's gone to us, right, well, I can't take that ship back. He goes, because I'm not sailing in that. He says, you're going to have to do a partial refit. Where are you taking it? We were taking this ship back to a place called Chittagong in Bangladesh to scrap it. But they wouldn't go. I managed to I managed to get a friend of mine to drop some weapons off. He came in via sea. I shouldn't have had weapons. I managed to get some weapons. Get them onto the ship. Take this thing back. Drop the weapons off in the sea. Take this thing out of Chittagong and throw it away. Right. You know I mean? But insane. Just crazy. Crazy Mate, jobs. crazy. Crazy jobs. Did you know that you, what you were letting yourself in for at the start? I mean, you, you knew it wasn't going to be easy. You, as, as, as but, that's pro- but that's proper danger money. You're go, you're flying out yeah. there to jump on a ship with no weapons. Yeah. Knowing Somalians have got weapons coming yeah. in there. To- yeah, I'm quite happy. I'm quite happy. I've done a, I've done a few jobs. I've done a couple of jobs recently. I went to I went to Ukraine with no weapons. I'm quite happy with it. I can work it out. Do you know what I mean? I'm all right. <laughs> I've seen the size of those fists. <laughs> yeah. That helps your hammers. No, the hammers. <laughs> so we're talking like mid 2000, 2008, 9, 10. What, what else has gone on in your world in that sort of, this past sort of 10 years? Um, I've seen you explode. I've in seen the you exp- last, so I, 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 it really, Wendy started looking in at me now and going, Phil, you know, you're going to keep this up forever. Because yeah. although we were, we, were, we were earning quite good money sometimes, yeah. we were drinking it away when I came home. We weren't really doing anything productive. So I says to her, look, we, we, I, I'll see if I can find something else to do. Yeah. I'd written the book Born Fearless. Born Fearless had done really well. It was a Times bestseller. Um, I did get in a little bit of trouble as well. I ended up, I ended up in, in Winchester, Nick, on a remand thing. It all got blown over eventually. But whilst I was in hold there... On, hold on, hold yeah. on. You ain't getting away with that, Phil. <laughs> Let's go back to Winchester and Mind. Tell me what happened there. Right, so afternoons drinking, Pete Tong, back to the house. Started off a sort of like domestic argument with a, a neighbour interjected over the fence. I put a win- I put a window through. I screamed and yelled at this lunatic that I was going to kill him. Before I know, I'm getting arrested for attempted murder on him because right, okay. he's, he's phoned up the old bill. Because of who I am, Wendy tried to calm it all down, but it wasn't being calmed down as far as the police are concerned. They took me. I had a bit of a rollabout with them in the street. As soon as they've got me, they then started. You know, they 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 they. they, they came in with this a charge of attempted murder on him and myself. I'm like, oh my God, what do I do with this? Oh, Duty lawyer says to me, just keep your mouth shut. Yeah. So I kept my mouth shut. In the meantime, all sorts was going on. They told her that she had to get out of the house and all this sort of stuff. So they were driving this like wedge, yeah. this nice little wedge in between us. I mean, in the end, I mean, to the proof of the pudding, we're still together and, and things worked out and everything, there was no charges brought to bear and all that sort of stuff. But what but I ended up ultimately in Winchester Prison. So I get straight from, straight from being up in front of the beak on the Monday, this is quite a funny little yeah. story, right? So the beak, the beak's there, and he's been told all about, you know, why I should be remanded in custody, and the, the obviously the opposition are uh, doing everything, and they've turned around, and I've stood next to my brief in the thing, and they've turned around, and they've gone, um, uh, and we believe Mr. Campion to be the most dangerous man in Hampshire, and I says to my brief, I'd love to see how they got in Dorset. <laughs> I'm sure they heard because they're like, really? Yeah, you can go and meet the lot of them yeah, in Winchester yeah, now. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? So off I goes, off I goes. Like I say, but I had a real, a real sort of like mental health thing in there where I'm like, right, this is this is serious. This is now. serious. What year is this? this? Is fucking, I don't know. Um, only about eight or nine years ago, I suppose. Eight or nine okay. years ago from now, this is now at yeah. a point where I've, I've literally, and I'll say this to people now, right? People have always said to me all my life, you're crazy if you talk to yourself. I say to people, you're crazy if you don't. Because yeah. when I was in Winchester, I debriefed myself in the mirror. I'm like that. You know, like that scene Don Logan yeah. in yeah. Sexy Beats. Yeah. And he yeah. goes, no, 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 liberties, liberties. He's taking liberties. I had one of those conversations with myself in the mirror. Like, you, son, you're an absolute C word. Like, you know, we're like, you ain't going to get away with that. You need to sort yourself yeah. out, son. Yeah. You know what I mean? Give yourself a, beat yourself up in the mirror, basically. I said, you've got to sort yourself out. Do you know okay. what I mean? Came out of there. Um, I was on a tag for Christ knows how long. You were a tag, were you? I was on a how tag. How long? How long? About six or seven months. Oh. I, so I ended up, um, I couldn't go back to Hampshire. She ended up living somewhere else for a while because she'd been told she couldn't go there. So I ended up living in a, in a what I'd done was I got a friend of mine, well, not a friend, my cousin, he had a building site in London. And I said, look, 
He said, if you can get yourself a caravan, he said, go and stick it on the building site. He said, I'll give you 20, I'll give you 50 quid a day. He said, you'll be the security at night. He said, you can fill a few skips during the day. Yeah, done. Job's done. So I put on Facebook and a mate of mine, Tom Blake, the ex, ex parachute regiment says, I'll give, he goes, if you, go, if you can get the South Cerny, he goes, there's a lovely caravan there, you can have it. So I get to South Cerny, <laughs> I swear to God, I'm driving there, I'm looking for number 27 in the window of this caravan. I'll drive past all these one. That's a nice one, yeah, I like that one. There's this one in the corner, it's got mould all over it, it's green, it's absolutely, you can't see through the windows. The curtain are in bits 27 <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ungrateful I swear I'm not ungrateful I'm like yeah, yeah cheers Tom thank you so much puts it on the back of I had a little Land Rover dif- dif- uh, Discovery I think um, no, no the, the Freelander I had the Freelander puts it on the back of that drags it into London puts it in the thing whilst I'm in London I think to myself right I'll, I'm, I'm giving Wendy I'm going 50-50 with Wendy um, and were you married to Wendy this time or no, no we're, still, we're still not married we're still, we're no. still, we're still okay. giving her but yeah. I goes we go 50-50 on the, on the dough and I basically get to, I'm, I'm, I'm providing the security at night. But what I do is I think to myself, right, where can I go from here? I can't fill skips for the rest of yeah. my life. I can't be doing this for the rest of my life. It ain't going to happen. I can't, this ain't going to pay for nothing. So I've got a copy of Born Fearless. I go down to the charity shop. I buy a, I buy a whistle, buy a nice nice yeah. suit, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was a Ted Baker one, yeah, right? Lovely. Like a little, little bit of shiny, a little bit of bling, you know what I mean? Nice little shirt, little tie, you know what I mean? And I go down to places like the Ivy and that, and I'm yeah. cutting around the Ivy at night, and every time I hear one of these TV types talk about anything to do with the military, military, you say military, right? Yeah. Uh, did, Phil Gampion wrote yeah. a book, XSAS. Before I know it, I'm like the talking head on Sky yeah. News. Anything yeah. goes off. Phone goes, to you, isn't it? Big Phil, yeah. Right. You're everywhere. Ends up making a ends up making a documentary for Sky News. End up doing this program called, and I just built this sort of like media profile off of complete bullshit. Yeah, complete and utter bullshit. Do you know what I mean? What just, do you mean? Uh, but it wasn't what do you bullshit. Mean, what do you mean complete and utter it wasn't bullshit? Com- because I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't a TV guy at all. Yeah, but do you know but, what I mean? But you're honest. I am. Yeah, that's. I think <laughs> that's what pulled it through. Mate, you're honest. You, know you can't I mean? beat honesty. And if someone's listening. On the news, and you come up, and they're saying, "What do you reckon about the terrorist film?" What well, this we, is so. We, a prime example. I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think about terrorists who are in London, who are still in London, and they're on the list? Well, they should be rounded up and shipped out. Simple as. And this was the message I was saying. A lot of the stuff I said was close to the bone. A lot of the stuff was 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 quite gritty and grainy. Sky and I parted company after a while because you know they're like. They are far too woke for the sort yeah. of stuff I say. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not bad. I don't say anything really yeah. bad. I just, you know, a, a spade is a spade with yeah. me and a shovel's a shovel and yeah. a pick's a pick. And I ain't going to tell you a lie in between. Do you know what I mean? I had journalists say, what, why is he doing this sort of work? Why? why? Because when I was Special Forces, my primary role was to go and gather information, bring it back and tell it in such a way that nobody gets hurt when they act on that information. Yeah. So I know what I'm doing. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, a bit sort of like... Bit, anyway, so the, that's how the media stuff went. And like I say, I, I, I did blag my way in there because it was like there was no official route. So I literally bullshitted my way around a few of these clubs, meeting a few think, people. I don't then, think you have. I don't think you have. I think the credentials you've got and everything you've told me today, I don't think you've blagged it. I think you're the personality, the right person that people want to talk to because then they get proper answers. Quite possibly, but again, the TV, the TV world would, yeah, would, doesn't want the right answers sometimes, yeah, does it? Do you know the, what I mean? The public do. The public do. And every time and we this hear is why, you, you know, GB News are all over me at the moment. I do a lot of stuff with GB yeah. News now because they are tell, they, they they won't put the gag on me. They won't tell yeah. me to shut up. They'll well, let BBC me say what would. I've got to say. Channel BBC, Four BBC would. BBC have Channel Four nicked my ideas. What did Channel Four do? There was something going on with Channel Four yourself. Uh, right, so I did drugs come over the boats. I did drugs. Yeah, so right. This is the coup, right? Aaron Banks. I don't know who Aaron Banks is, but apparently he put a lot of money behind the Brexit campaign. Channel 4 had beef with Aaron Banks, right? Aaron Banks funded me, and I didn't know it came, where the money came from. He asked for somebody to go over to Calais, prove that it could be done, pick people up, bring them back, drop them off, and go under the radar and not have to go through customs. I said, I'll do that. I did that. I went over. The trace quite clearly showed that I did it. Okay, I went back over. I came over. I had the video evidence of me dropping guys on and off, all right? But the day before I went, I drove the coast a few times. And I made sure that I could find places to get on and off. I didn't want to go over there, come back and go, oh, I've I've, I've failed. So Mm. Channel 4, all right, in their attempt to uproot um, Aaron Banks, obviously came after me because I'd helped his Brexit campaign and as far as I'd proved that these people were coming over in small boats, yeah. right? So they tried to say that I hadn't done it when I had. Well, they caught me on the hop. They pulled me in for an interview under the pretense of we want to do it now. So I started talking to them about it and then they basically called me out. It caught me a little bit on the hop 
And I didn't come out smelling the roses from that interview. I looked a bit sort of like cagey, a bit sort of like, uh. And of course, people jumped straight down my back. Now, Sky, on the back of that, yeah. dropped everything with me like a hot potato. Yeah. Which, it was going that way anyway, to be honest. Mm. Channel 4 did the best to, 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 stitch, to, to stitch me up. The ironic thing is, about six or seven months later, Aaron Bank went to court, and that thing got brought up. Mm. And it was proved that there was, no, there was no wrongdoing at all. I did exactly what I said I was going to do. Mm. Do you think I ever got an apology off Sky? Do you think I ever... And do you, do you know what the, the crazy thing is? They've all tried to do it themselves yeah. now. They've all tried to go over there, come back and drive the ribs over there. They've all tried to prove... I'm like, I was telling you this years ago. Yeah. And then your stupid attempt and then your sort of like thing to try and smash the Brexit campaign, yeah. which I've got nothing to do with, and yeah. I quite frankly couldn't give a uh, yeah. monkey's either yeah. way. Yeah. You've, you, you lost... You cost me my living. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I was quite, not, I'm not bitter about it now, I don't care, but it's just, you know, an apology would be nice. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Especially from Sky News. And I got, you know, I've got older, you know, they know who they are there. Yeah. They know who they are, do you know what I mean? And it was, yeah, it was wrong. They're wrong. What's your relationship like now with Sky or Channel 4? Do you not want to do work with them? Are you looking at um, other channels? If they come back to you and went, Phil would like you to come on board, da 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 da. Uh, I, I, I think I'd have to sell my soul a little bit. They, they, they would have to eat some humble pie. I'd have to have an apology off them. Yeah. And I'd have to have an assurance that, you know, whatever I was going to do for them wouldn't impede or impair the way that I portray myself. Yeah. I, look, an instance with Sky News, I said something about Bloody Sunday. Um, they, they'd asked me on one of their pre-recorded programmes, did I, did, I, did I think what had happened on Bloody Sunday was justified? And I said, well, look, I don't know exactly what happened. I wasn't there. But I can tell you now that if people have fired, they would have fired for a good reason. They wouldn't have just done it for nothing. And to be fair, if you were completely innocent, you'd have been in your bed and you wouldn't have been out charging about causing trouble anyway. So there's a six and two thing. They cut that out of an interview altogether and almost made it look like I sort of like went, yeah, 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 okay. yeah. So I'm not, I'm and that gets me in trouble with my peers. How can I look my peers in the face and not back them up? Do you know yeah. what I mean? So... I'd have to have assurances from Channel 4. Mm. And, and Channel 4, I'll tell you another story about Channel 4. I don't want to gripe and spend my no, whole thing, because I don't whole, care anymore, yeah. really. But, you know, I did a programme for them called Jugs Live. Where I it took, old, old, called Jugs Live? Drugs Live. Drugs Live, <laughs> okay, yeah. Jugs. yeah so Wendy wouldn't let me <laughs> do Jugs <laughs> Live. <laughs> there you go, boys. <laughs> so, I'd, and it was all about dumping an ecstasy tablet yeah. and going in a brain scanner and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And Lily Allen's old man was on there. And yeah. Anyway, it had a bit of an adverse effect on me. But I came, away, I, came, I came across quite well on television mm. because I, I did say exactly how it was, all right? And I, I, just like we're talking yeah. now. So I get a phone call from a guy called David Glover, who was one of their commissioning officers. He says, do you want to come in? He says, we'll talk about, you know, where do you want to go with TV? What do you want to do? We'd like to see more of you on the screen and all this sort of stuff. So they funded a, um, a little pilot. I went to America. I've still got the pilot. It's quite cool. I went and shot a couple of pigs and that and, and did a bit of sort of like survival bush tucker type stuff and <laughs> wrestled with a couple of animals and that. You know what I mean? It was all right. It was good fun, right? <laughs> Give them that, and they said, oh, we don't really want this, but have you got any other ideas? So I said, yeah, I said, I've got a great idea. So why don't we replicate Special Forces selection and make it into a programme? Yeah. And I called that one, so they said, well, go away and write it up, Phil. So I went away, I wrote it up, sent it back in. They said, any other ideas? I said, yeah. I said, I've got another one. I said, whereby, why don't you set someone on the run, or a group of people on the run, yeah. and chase them with trained people? Hunted. Yeah. There you go, I called it on the run. Yeah. Hunted. They took those ideas of them. About six months later... A friend of mine says, oh, they're recruiting for a special forces programme on Channel 4. So I phoned up David Glover. I said, what? I said, you've taken my idea then? No, not really. He said, someone came to us with a rather similar idea. He said, and we've decided, and we're rather full for special forces types now, so you're sort of like out, out, out of the frame. Oh, you yeah, twat. Yeah. You absolute. Yeah. And look, I don't begrudge, you know, Billy's a great guy. Foxy's yeah. a great guy. Yeah. It's some, you know, they've done a great, a great deal with that show, and yeah. I don't begrudge them that one 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 bit, do you know what I mean? If they asked you to come on the show, would you? Oh, I think there's a lot of the public would want me to go on that show. Mm. Lots of people have always said they'd want me on that show. I'd, I'd, like I said, I'd, I'd need the assurances off Channel 4 that they weren't going to try and upend me and make me look stupid again. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because that's that's ultimately what they've always tried to do. I think you'd be absolutely brilliant on the show. It'd be fun. But I'm, not sure be get away. I'm not sure you'd get away with being the mole. <laughs> <laughs> Massive mole! <laughs> <laughs> what would you do? I want to roll back a little bit. You said you had mental health issues, mental health problems going on, and all that was kicking off on the remand. What was going through your mind? Don't know. I, I dug deep on some of that because I had a few issues when I was in as well. And I look, mental health is one of these things I've massively tried to champion because I have struggled with a couple of things. I struggled when a friend of mine got killed, and it was nothing combat related. He was in a car crash, and I struggled with it. I struggled with the way it happened. I struggled with a lot of things with that. And I didn't feel like you could talk about it. And so I didn't. And so I bottled it up. And I don't want to blame my behaviour on, 
on mental health because I have been a lunatic, right? Mm. I, have, I am capable of being a lunatic, mm. okay? But there has been, on occasions, times when the mental health thing has probably fueled a little bit the way I feel and, and, and pushed me into, into the way that I act. Do you know what I mean? Now, I, even now, talking about... I, just, I can envisage people looking at this going, shit, twat, he's just going to try and blame everything on mental health yeah. now. I'm not, because yeah. I am a lunatic and I have been that man that likes to punch up and I can quite happily get myself into trouble and, and be quite all right with it, yeah. do you know what I mean, sometimes. But I'm not a nasty man. I'm not, yeah. a, I'm not a horrible man. I wouldn't nick your dinner money, do you know what yeah. I mean? Um, so in that respect... There have been times where, you know, I've been low. I've struggled for what way to go. And I felt, especially with the with the sexual stuff, I couldn't talk about it. Yeah, I didn't want to talk about it. I, I bottled it up for years yeah. and years and years. When's the time you actually look back, your time to stop and look back and go, oh God, that went on when I was 8, 9, 10, 11 with all the sexual stuff and actually had to deal with it? Um, I bottled the, 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 you know, at the time. And this is this sounds so wrong, right? This sounds so wrong. At the time, there was another lad, and I can't remember his name, um, that we would almost joke about the first lot and say, you know, well, if their hands are, if their hands are warm, it can be quite pleasant, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's honking, isn't it? Yeah. It's funny, but it, yeah. and that's how you dealt with it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's black humour. It does, yeah. it brings a smile to my face yeah. now thinking about it. That is so wrong, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It is wrong. That's how you dealt with it. Yeah. And so, you know, at the time, I sort of like, I, I pigeonholed it myself. I put it in bed by that, you know, and whatever, do you know what I mean? Move on, look for the next thing. Mm. It wasn't until <coughs> I was doing an after dinner for some NHS organisation in Birmingham and I literally was stood there in front of all these people and uh, the, the, I had to go on at nine o'clock and I got there early so I ended up watching the bloke in front of me and he was talking about foster homes and how some little kid had been interfered with and how if they could identify the perpetrators before they actually went through the system but they never got to identify them because not enough people would come up and talk about this sort yeah. of stuff so they struggled with finding and I thought it was oh, hang on a minute I'm sat on something here. I'm, I'm literally yeah. I am the kid that was interfered with and yeah. I've never said nothing yeah. and because I've never said nothing perhaps if I had have done they might have been able to identify or at least put that into a format where they could go right there's a there's a check there you should make before you yeah. before you let them do it. So I walked out. This, this room's got three four hundred people in it, right? I swear, people I don't even know, right? I've never spoken about a word of this, not even with Wendy, right? So I've literally I've got this speech prepared about how happy my time was in care and all this yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm taking me thousand pound for me after dinner, yeah. and I'm going home as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And I'm way up to walking up to the stage. I will tell you what side I threw it on the floor. I walked up and I told the story about what had happened. I told them the details. I told them how the bloke had done this. I told them about what he did there. I told them the wow. apps. You could have heard a pin drop. You could have you could have gone, wow, this is insane. Do you know what I mean? There was people weeping in the crowd. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was it was it was heavy stuff. Yeah. And I just said to them, look, I've only done it because of what that guy said there. I said I could never have done that. I've, I, this has been sat in me for 40 odd years. Do you know what I mean? I've only done it because of that. I said, so look, whatever you take from this, Please, you know, learn from what I'm telling you. Do you know what I mean? And then, like I say, it, it spurred me on to writing, writing it into another book. You know, and hopefully, maybe it will have an impact somewhere. Do you know what I mean? That's powerful. Is it, yeah, it is powerful. That yeah. is really And powerful. there's so many kids out there with yeah. a story like that. Yeah, loads. And I just feel, yeah. I just, look, look, something else is thought like, the, the special forces thing has actually helped me there because people look at me and they go, right, he was special forces. So there's that thing around you, and I know that, I'm not stupid, there's a thing about you where people will look at you and go, wow, he's special forces, he must be. I'm not an old man. I'm not, I'm not you know, I've, I've learned a few things in my time and I'm not scared of, of, of much, all right? But there is this aura, and I can use that aura now. Yeah. To, 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 I can say that, and people won't turn around, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I can say that, and it is powerful, and I know that, do you know what I mean? So all the stuff that I've learned, all the stuff that I've done wrong, I'm not ashamed to say anything. If I was ashamed to say it, I wouldn't say it. I'd, mm. buy, I'd, I'd keep it to myself. But everything I've ever done, everything I've ever done wrong, I've always now put out there because people can learn from it. All the stupid mistakes, all the times I didn't listen to people. When I talk to young people now, and you know, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the head ambassador for the Army Cadet Force, and I get a lot of young people asking me all these questions. I feel I'm in a position where I can really help them yeah. by being honest yeah. and saying, look, you know, listen to people. Try and do your best at school. Try and learn here. Try and do that. Try and have activities. Don't be afraid to get it wrong. Yeah. Don't be afraid to lose. Stand up. All this sort of stuff is all stuff that I've learned. Do you know what I mean? So, and it's all stuff now that I'm an older man. I'm trying to put back into the system to help other people. Powerful, mate. You're like a, a, a an amazing role model for a lot of kids out there. And for you to get up on stage and say that off the cuff when you built this up for forty odd years, massive respect to you. It was hard. I'm, yeah. I'm going to tell you it was hard. But again, 
nothing is impossible. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Did you just feel that was the right time to do it? You were building up for a long time, guys. It needs to come out somewhere. It needs to come out somewhere. And at that moment, you're like, right. Like you said, through the I piece never, of paper. I never was... really thought about it. I never thought, when I sort of like compartmentalised it, when I threw it in the bin at the back of my head, I never thought it would ever come out. I'd never thought I'd talk to anybody about it. And just that one bloke, that one trigger just went, no, you've got to do this, yeah. you've got to do that. And what, what's more is you're in a position where you can do yeah. it. Do you know what I mean? And you'd be spineless if you didn't do it. What advice, Phil, have you got? Anyone listening out there, and this happened to them when they were a kid, and they haven't dealt with it? Talk to someone about it. I, I say I was like a bottle of a bottle of Coke where someone had taken the top off it, got a whole packet of Mentos, shoved it in there and put the top back on it, bounced it a couple of times yeah. and left it in the corner. It's got to come out, all yeah. right? And it will come out somewhere if you don't control it. Now, what I've done is I've done the cap really sort of like slowly. Yeah. And I've managed to get it out and yeah. I've talked about it. And do you know what? I feel like a normal bottle of Coke now. Yeah. I feel all right. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Mate. I feel good. It's out there. So look, you, you've got to, I don't say go and tell the world, TikTok it or stick it on Instagram. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Tell somebody. Yeah. Tell someone you love. Tell yourself first. Tell yourself in the mirror. That happened. Yeah. I need to tell someone. Well, a problem shared is a problem half. Yeah. It really is. It honestly is. I'm, I'm adamant by that. It helped me out so much. Unbelievable, mate. Unbelievable. Moving on. What have your thoughts on the whole Ukraine Russia thing? And have you been out to Ukraine? I went out to Ukraine early days um, and I helped a few people get back, get out of there. I've got a couple of people over the border. Um, it's a dangerous place. Again, it's a war zone. Honking people are making honking decisions out there. There's a lot of stuff out there that's absolutely disgusting. It's a, a very, very... It's the normal people again, isn't it? It's the normal. When when I the first thing that stuck with me was when I got to Poland, was seeing these streams of women holding children, whose old men are like stuck now, gonna have to fight. They don't know if they'll ever see them again. You know, that's not a normal thing to say. Mm. That's like taking one of the biggest estates, saying somewhere like Southampton, taking Millbrook, shaking it until yeah. all the women find fall out of it, yeah. leaving the blokes in there, surrounding it with Russians, and going right, they might see you again, right, see you later. Yeah. It ain't right, it ain't yeah. normal, it ain't good. And whatever, you know, whatever the reasons are that they're fighting, I just really pray to God that they can find a way through it which 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 nullifies it and, and satisfies both sides as soon as possible because it ain't it ain't nice. No. It ain't good. Did you feel the urge to go out there and help? Uh no, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you on this one. I, <laughs> my pocket felt the urge. I needed yeah. the dough. I got okay. paid for it. I got paid I got paid well for it. So I went over there and I did that and I came back and I'm not you know, I'm not gonna make any bones about it. I didn't I didn't feel compelled to get involved. I didn't feel like I needed to go over there. I didn't, you know, you know. I'd, I'd like to say that I would probably support anything that supports the Ukrainians. Do you know what I mean? But again, there's not much I can actually do. You know, the British government is doing what it can. It's it's a it's a real horrible situation. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And obviously, if you looked at the propaganda from the other side, mm. they'll be telling you a completely different mm. story, won't they? Do you know what I mean? Mm. So you do get if you if you look at the stuff online now, you'll start you're starting to pick up two sides of a story, aren't mm. you? Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it's a it's a difficult, complicated mm. situation again. But ultimately the only people that are suffering are the normal people. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The people that are using soldiers on both sides of the coin, yeah. the people that are stuck in these estates, the people that have had to do a runner, the people that obviously have already lost their lives in it. It's not these po politicians, it's not the ones in the ivory tower. What will you pay to actually do? Get, just go and help someone get back over the border. So get them from Ukraine yeah, over get, the border get, in get, Poland. Yeah, get them to Poland. Get shot. And what? Give me an example. What your day would look like? It you saying you get them it, over the border? It, have you got, have it, you got it, a badge or something? No, so I'm da da da. Get them no, over. See, this, this, or are you sneaking I, them through? I literally, or? literally went over there, provided them with some information enough for them to get themselves over the border, and they did. I got arrested actually on the border, so <laughs> I, <laughs> I got, yeah, yeah, I got, I got looked at myself over there. It's, it's, it, like I say. We've, we've, I've moved away from that. We didn't do anything wrong, but you know, well, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, extremely yeah. dangerous on that border. I'm sure it is, mate. And uh, it just seems that this danger just follows you everywhere, or you follow the danger everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, six and two, three. Six and two, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Tell me, um, what did you get arrested for? Um, being on being on the border, being being across the border. So they've got like this great big track goes all the way around. Um, we gave these people an idea of where they could get across it. We knew it was censored, so we went down there. Um, I said I was creating a press story. Yeah. So I said I was press. 
which wasn't a complete lie because I was looking for press stories while I was there. Yeah. So, you know, if I'd have found something that was press worthy, I would have used it. I, I, you know, I had press stickers on the car and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I directed them to tell them that if you want to get across, this is probably your best chance of doing it. Right. And so literally as they, they did their bits and pieces, I I stuck, I stuck coughed when the police turned up. Yeah. So the police preoccupied themselves with us. Yeah. And hopefully, and I don't know if they did or they didn't, hopefully whoever was trying to get across the border Amazing. got back again. They, they were Ukrainians. I mean, I'm not... This was the big worry from the police. They thought we were Russian. Right. So they thought we were one of these Russian lunatic teams going in to execute people, which obviously we weren't. Do you know what I mean? We just... And were you carrying? No. No, again? No, no, no. Jesus Christ. Which, again, so the day when we'd gone down and had a look at what was going on on the border, yeah. we'd been seen by the eye in the sky. Mm. All right, so we'd been seen by someone. So when we went down the next day, they was already teeing something up. So the Ukrainians were there. Now, the Ukrainians, apparently, I've been told, were were, were on the brink of were on the brink of knocking us out. Like, do you know what I mean? Because they thought that we were Russians. They thought we were Russians trying to sneak in and out of the border. So it was, it's a dangerous game. I got away with it by the skin of my teeth. Mm. I wouldn't advise anybody to go over there unless you're going over in an official capacity. Do you know what I mean? Aid work is slightly different. Okay, you can go over there, you can do your bits and pieces, but don't take any risks. It seriously is a dangerous, unforgiving, hostile environment. It really is horrendous. Do you know what I mean? What are your movements now, Phil? What are your movements now? Right, so I... Yeah. Lockdown, lockdown was horrendous for us. We were living over in Spain. It, I, we, I was looking, I was working with a little production company over there. All their work went south. Everything yeah. went. So we're in Spain. We got no money. So we sold everything we had. We came back. I've got an house in Southampton. We came back. We bought a narrowboat, um, and the, and we lived on a narrowboat for a bit. And I got got in with a friend of mine, and we set up a, a radio station. Which hopefully, you know, that, that that's going to go places. So we yeah. set up our own radio station, Force Radio. That's doing its bits and pieces. I picked up a couple of brand ambassador type roles. So I'm sort of like integrating myself back into being in the UK full time at some stage, do you know what I mean? And then yeah. just stepping away from all that stuff. Do you know? yeah. I don't even want to do the body garden anymore, to be honest. You know? yeah. I don't want to do nothing with security in it whatsoever yeah. anymore. I'm quite happy doing this. I think TV's crying out for you, mate. I, mate, the, 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 I've done out. some really cool stuff yeah. with Bear Grylls. Whenever I'm with him, you know, he always says, he always says to me, right? He always says, you are fantastic talent being poorly managed. I'm not being managed yeah. at all. I don't have a manager. You don't have a manager. I don't, I don't have a manager. I don't have an agent. I don't have anything. So I'm blunt. I'm looking. If anyone out there thinks they can manage me, give me an agent. Hello. Give me a shout. <laughs> all right. Get me into reality TV. Yeah. You'll only do it once. We'll be made for life. Yeah. All right. Get me in the Big Brother house or something. We're off. We're up and running and we're, we're, we're done. Mate, let's have a talk after this. Oh, we'll have a talk. Definitely. Let's have but a talk. See do... what doors we can open. Yeah, definitely. Mate. I think, you know, go for the right one. You know, I've got I've got some quite big backers. Piers Morgan likes what I do. He's, he's yeah. always given me a good reference. Bear. Yeah. Loves what I do. Bear's coming on the podcast. Oh, is he really? Yeah, mate. Oh, he's a great guy, yeah. mate. I get, on really, I get on really well with Bear. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? No, we have, we, we've had some good laughs. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing a challenge for him at the moment, this, this, this um, barbarian challenge. So he says to me, he says, we're doing this challenge in my garden. He says, he says, it's not that hard, Phil. He says, you'll be all right. So I think nothing of this. Right? I've, I've, had the, I've had the World Cup. I've had Christmas. I've spent the whole thing on the Beano. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm fuller than a fat girl's shoes. I'm wandering around going, right, better lose some weight. It's January. Like, do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> Bear says, right, come up to my place. Get up to Bear's. And he's got all his gear out in the garden. And that, you know, Hunter from, um, what's it called? Hunter from uh, the Gladiators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, there. Never yeah. met, really nice guy, yeah. but he's there flexing and that. Yeah. And he's ready to go. And another officer from the Royal Marines, he's there ready to yeah. go. And Phil turns up like the Teletubby. Like, do you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, right, okay. <laughs> so what the deal is, you've got a 30K, a 33K weight in each hand, a 33K dumbbell in each hand, 10Ks on each leg, carrying something like 35, 40K on your back, dragging a 50K sledge. Oh, Jesus. I'm not really. <laughs> so I, oh, right, well, I'll have to give it a go because he's like called me out and he's filming it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, oh, God, we'll go. So I get into it. I, I, I think I've got about a third of the way down yeah. there. My heart was literally going to come out through one of my nostrils. You know what I mean? So we, we called it. He called it a day. He's like, right, Phil, you better stop. You're gonna, you're gonna literally, but I've said that I'll do that later in the year and I think I'm going to go back up to this place. Tonight. I will I will do it this Mate, year. Mate, I I'll think you're it. made to be a massive celebrity on TV. You're made for this, Phil. Well, I, 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 I appreciate your confidence, mate. And Mate. It could be epic. It could be fun. Uh, mate, no, I think you're made for this, mate. Anyone listening out there, <laughs> before we end up finishing up here, Phil, tell me the names of the books, where people can find it, and where people can find you. Right, so all my social media, apart from TikTok, is at Big Phil Campion. TikTok's at Big Phil Campion 01 because somebody nicked my name. No. <laughs> there is a Big Phil Campion, but it's not me. It's yeah. somebody just <laughs> randomly nicking all my stuff and putting it up, right? And uh, so... 
Yeah, so everything's at Bedfield Camping. That's Twitter, Facebook, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, my books, then you can get books in the normal places, Amazon, online, the auto book, all the all the normal sweet stuff. Born Fearless um, is the first one. That was the Times bestseller. The stuff with all the with all the kids' own stuff in that I just mentioned is is called Who Dares Wins. Yeah. That's also out there. I wrote two novels. I'm going to be perfectly honest. They weren't. They, they were well written, but because I wasn't a big enough name, they yeah. didn't. They didn't do as well as they probably should have done. Because Damien did a great job of writing them with me. Damien who? Damien Lewis. Okay. So Damien Lewis wrote the wrote. Oh, wow. the, he's, he's my ghostwriter. We've been friends for years. Um, so, yeah, get on board those two books because they're great. I'd love to see them do something. And I wrote a survival guide, which my publishers stitched me up, and they wouldn't. They, wouldn't, they, they, they run out of them. I can't get them for love nor money, but because they did them in a funny size, they go, well, we can't print them unless you can flog sort of like a thousand at a time. Yeah. And I haven't got a thousand buyers, so yeah. that's the end of it. If you've got one of them, they're like they're like rocking horse. They're like hen's teeth. Hen's <laughs> teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, anyone listening out there, Phil's playing this down, but those two other books, I reckon they're going to get snapped up by someone. I hope so. I, I hope so. I think they will. Yeah. And, and what you're doing at the moment and what you've done for our country, Phil, and bringing humour, everything you've done, bringing humour to the whole world you've lived in for the last 50 years is massively commendable. And I know that the amount of respect you've got from everyone in the Special Forces, SAS, Army, RAF, everyone knows Big Phil Campion and they love you. Well, no, I, you know, and I, I really appreciate that yeah. as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's, it's something that... You know, I don't, I don't treat that even lightly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's something that you know, that's that's yeah. not the given, is it? Do you yeah. know what I mean? And you can, you can destroy all that. Yeah. <laughs> so Phil, I've had, I've had 140 guests I've done over the last couple of years, and I've never had the mo- a, a fascinating episode than I've had just now. Well, that's, that's and I've really, had a lot of big I really, guests. I really on. appreciate that. Yeah, really. mate, you're an absolute gentleman, mate, and I wish you all the best. And I think a lot of doors are going to open up. I hope so. Yeah, quality, <laughs> mate. Cheers. You're Thank you very much. Cheers, Phil. Cheers. No, Good man. Appreciate that. Good man. <laughs>